What is something scary that has happened to you that you cannot explain rationally? Sit back, relax, and soak it all in. If you like what you hear, hit subscribe and share Thread Tonic with your crew. Account 1. I doubt that anyone will see this, but what the hell, I will share my sister's experience. My sister and brother-in-law used to live on base. Brother-in-law is in the Air Force, and as far as I know, this is the only strange thing that happened in that house. One day, my sister and her husband were sitting on the couch playing on their phones when my sister asked my brother-in-law to get her a bottle of water from the fridge. Being the lazy people they are, he said he would in a minute. About five minutes later, they both look up and see a bottle of water just sitting there on the coffee table. Neither one had gotten up at all. Not really scary, but definitely unexplainable. Account 2. One time, my mom and I were sitting in the living room watching TV. Out of the corner of my eye, I see this black thing come through the wall, then float down through the floor. It was kind of like a shaped black smoke, very black. I thought it was just a floater in my eye or something as I sat there staring at it. Then I thought I was just tired and seeing things. A moment later, my mom asked me if I had just seen that. That is when I got goosebumps. We had no idea what it was. Account 3. This is a long one, but my old house was haunted. At least if you believe in ghosts. If you do not, there is not much I can really say to make you believe me, and I do not really care either way, but we did have some local ghost hunters come by and check it out, and they freaked out and said it was the most haunted house they had ever been in. It was not an old house. My father built it back in, like 92, but it was only a couple of hundred yards from a cemetery, and the basement was underground, so you were pretty much on the same level the coffins would be. We had all kinds of really weird stuff happen there. You would hear people talking, but you could not understand the words. You would hear floorboards creaking as people walked around and doors would open and close, etc. One that really stands out was when my father and I were in our basement. That was his den. He had a TV and chair and all his man cave stuff down there, and we were watching TV. My mother and sisters were out of town, so we knew we were alone. We heard a door slam upstairs and then heard someone walk across the house to my parents' bedroom, directly above my father's den. We heard drawers open and be pulled out, so we assumed it was burglars. He grabbed a gun, and I got a bat, and we ran upstairs to see, but there was nothing there. Nobody was in any room, and nothing was moved or taken, but we both heard it clear as day. Speaking of his den, you could hear his TV on 24-7. When I was home alone, I would lay on my parents' floor and listen to the TV through the floor. You could hear the TV on with people talking. I would go downstairs and put my ear to the door leading into his area, and you could still hear the TV going. But when you opened the door, it was never on. That kind of thing happened all the time. Two separate times, a group of people saw a woman in a white dress standing at the base of the stairs in the basement. Once was when my sister had a sleepover with like eight or nine girls sleeping in the downstairs family room. Someone woke up and saw the woman and started screaming, and the rest all woke up and saw her too. They swear she stood there for a few seconds, then slowly backed into the darkness. My mother saw her in the same spot a few years later when she says the woman stepped right off the wall beside her and just walked right past her without looking at her. I mentioned the ghost hunters going there as well. They were a local group, pretty much the only one in the area, and loved going to creepy places looking for ghosts. My uncle was one of them, which was how they got involved. He had heard us talk about the house and was obsessed with trying to get in and test it. My father always told him no and joked, saying the ghosts were friendly, and he did not want to make them mad by bringing in ghost hunter types to antagonize them. He finally relented and said sure because we were moving and had the house sold. They came in after we were moved out and did whatever it is they do. The new owners were friends of his and did not care if he came in and did it and they had already moved some stuff in. My uncle said that within seconds of them just asking the ghost if they were there, they could hear a door slam downstairs. They asked simple questions like, if you can hear me, open this cabinet door, and said it would happen. Then they asked if they were angry. My uncle described the response as, as soon as we asked if they were angry, there came the most unearthly yowling and shrieking sound from the basement. What it was, was the new owner's cat that was downstairs. It started flipping out and then sprinted up the stairs and started attacking the door at the top of the stairs, wanting out of the basement like it was running from something. 
After the new owners moved in, they had all kinds of weird stuff happen to them, too. For one, they said the cat would never go downstairs again. The family had the wife's father living with them because he was old and dying. He could barely get around, but was not on the verge of death or anything. He was just old. They came home one day to him babbling about a man walking up and sitting at the dining room table next to him while he was eating. He kept saying the guy would not talk to him or look at him. He just sat there for a while, then got up and went downstairs. So there are my experiences. There is not any way to prove any of it really, but the house is still there, and last I heard from the new owners, they still experience creepy stuff all the time. There were a billion other minor things I did not include because it would take too long. I lived there for 16 or 17 years, so I had more than my fair share of weird stuff. TLDR, house was haunted and weird stuff happened a lot. Ghost hunter guys came in and it scared them too. Dozens of people all experienced the creepy stuff. I am not sure what was going on. The logical side of me says there must have been some kind of explanation, but I do not know what it was. Account 4. When I was six years old, I had a cat named Buster. Buster was actually my stepdad's cat, but because I never had a cat before, I claimed him as my own. Suffice it to say, Buster did not like being hugged and coddled all the time by a little child, so he hated me. He avoided me at all costs. He was also an outdoor cat, so he would often spend most days outside and then come in for the night. One night, Buster did not come back in the house. We usually fed him at night, so I was worried. Our area was also well known for an abundance of coyotes. My parents were being a bit hush-hush about Buster's disappearance, but I did not get the hint. That night, when I was drifting off to sleep, Buster jumped onto my bed. He lay down by my head and let me pet him until I fell asleep. Honestly, I was shocked because he had never done this before. The next morning, I triumphantly walked downstairs and related to my parents that Buster now loved me because he slept in my bed during the night. My parents looked at me inquisitively and sat me down at the breakfast table to let me know that while they were outside the night before, they had found Buster's body in the alley behind our house. They thought he had been harassed by a coyote, but he was dead so he could not have slept in my bed that night. To this day, I like to think that Buster just wanted to say goodbye and thank me for trying to love him in the only way a child knew how. Account 5. My family owns a decent-sized horse boarding facility, and when we first had it going, we used to do bed checks as a family. Bed check is just making sure all the lights and fans were off as well as looking at the horses for injuries and if they had blankets during the winter. Well, we had just gotten back from eating out and it was a moonless night during fall. As we stepped out of the truck, this large light gray mass stood up and took off loping towards our pastures. It was about the size of a single cab pickup truck. It made no noises other than it hitting the ground as it ran. The only other proof that it was real to us was the horses that were turned out that night screamed and stampeded across the pasture it had jumped into. We did a double count of all the horses that night and not a single one was missing. I still have yet to see it again. And I hope I never do, or at least there is some explanation for it. 6. When I was in university, I lived by myself. It was a nice little studio unit behind a house in a fairly decent area. I would honestly think nothing of walking places at night. There was a 24-hour McDonald's and a 7-Eleven that I would walk to, often between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m., since I was a massive night owl. Well, one day after finishing an essay at about 2 in the morning, I decided I was hungry but did not really have anything easy to cook, so I decided to walk down to the 7-Eleven and grab a pie or something. However, as soon as I opened my door, I was overcome by a suffocating feeling of fear. My heart started pounding, I started shaking, the works, telling myself that this was ridiculous. I walked out to the street with the intent to still go, but that was as far as I got. I was terrified for no reason that I could understand, but no less intensely despite that. I ran back inside and ate dry cereal. Later the next day, I heard about a group of drunk guys that were causing havoc down near the intersection at the 7-Eleven. They had beaten up someone from my university. Even though I cannot explain it, I am convinced something bad would have happened to me that night if I had ignored that feeling and gone anyway. Account 7. It was near Halloween time when my friends and I were telling ghost stories. My friend said she was going to tell a story about her parents' first date. She said she did not like telling the story, since it was actually true, but we prodded her on. 
To cut to the chase, the parents had spent a nice, if awkward, first date, and around the time that they would have said, good night, the male in the situation, my friend's dad, suggested that they go for a midnight hike up Provo Canyon. He apparently knew the place since he had done a fair amount of rock climbing in the area. So the two drove up the mouth of the canyon, got out of their cars, and started hiking under just the light of the stars since it was a new moon. At some point, the male starts getting a bad feeling since the pathway ahead, which would pass under some trees, would be dark, and because it was getting to be quite late. He ignores the feeling and presses on. In later rehearsings of the story, the female would say that she had felt the same feeling at what was probably the same time, though she did not know the trail like he did. A minute later, the feeling came back to the male. He ignored it again and started walking a bit of the way into the trees when his foot hit something soft in the middle of the path. Under the trees, it was too dark to see just what this soft thing was, and the feeling came back stronger than ever. Instead of finding out what his foot had bumped into, he and the female both agreed to hightail it out of there. Years later, after being married for some time, they were watching an interview with the serial killer, Ted Bundy. In response to a question asking him to describe the time that he felt the closest to being caught, he explained about the night that he lured a girl into Provo Canyon and had just killed her when he heard some people coming up the trail. He explained how he hid in the trees just in time, only to watch some guy walk right into the body and for some reason just turn around and walk away. Tail deer. Friend's parents stumbled onto a fresh corpse left by Ted Bundy on their first date. Count eight. I woke up from an unsettling dream because my wrists were really sore. It turns out my boyfriend at the time had his hands clamped tightly around my wrists because I had fully tried to strangle him in his sleep and he was trying to get me off his throat. To this day, I have no memory or idea why I was strangling him. TLDR tried to strangle past boyfriend in my sleep. Count nine. My parents had been married for maybe a month. They were in bed sound asleep when all of a sudden my mom jumps up and wakes up my dad. Jimmy, Jimmy, there is blood everywhere. We have to help them, please. My dad tried his best to calm her down and figure out what she was talking about. My mom explained that she saw a car with a German license plate on the side of the road that there had been an accident and they needed help. My dad tried to console her and explain that it was all just a bad dream, but she was not having it. So, to appease her, they got in the car and drove to the spot my mom thought the accident was. And sure enough, at the exact spot my mom said, there was a car on the side of the road with German plates and emergency flashers on. Upon closer investigation, there was nobody in the car. If they needed help, help had already come. Count 10. My parents had just had their first child, my oldest sister, Kathy. They had been living in Italy at the time. My dad was in the Air Force and had brought her back to the U.S. to introduce her to the grandparents, my dad's parents. So their first night there, my mom was asleep in the front bedroom, jet-lagged. My dad had gone out to hang out with his brothers. And in the middle of the night, this woman walks into my mom's room, waking her up. She sits down on the bed and says, Shh, it is okay. I just wanted to welcome you to the family. My mom was scared, obviously, but figured this was some relative or family friend or something that came over. The woman walks over to the bassinet where my baby sister was sleeping. Is this your daughter? My mom nodded. She is beautiful. It is lovely to meet you both. And then she leaves. My mom wakes up the next day and is having breakfast with my grandmother when she brings it up. Who was the woman that came over last night? My grandmother had no idea what she was talking about. My mom told her the whole story, and my grandmother asked what she looked like. My mom said she was tall, had long white hair, and was wearing a blue dress. My grandmother's face went as white as a sheet. She rummaged through some old pictures and pulled one out. Is this her? She asked my mom, who nodded in return. That is my mother. She has been dead for 20 years, and we buried her in a blue dress. Account 11. Probably too late, but here goes. I was working at a hotel in Albuquerque, the graveyard shift. I had been talking to the security guard, and he asked if he could get a ride home, so instead of waiting for 30 minutes for my shift to end, I just left and left a note for my boss that said I left early because my brother was stranded outside of town and needed me to get him. Total lie on my part, but I needed a good excuse to leave early. I dropped off the security guard at his place, then went home and went to sleep. A couple of hours of sleep and I wake up to my phone ringing. 
It was my brother. He tells me he is stranded outside of town and he needs me to go get him. I tell my brother the lie I told my boss and how much of a coincidence his calling me is. He says that's not weird. He will show me what's weird when I get there. I get there and ask him what is weird. He puts his phone up to my ear and plays a message that he got when he woke up that morning. It's a voice that kind of sounded computerized, but mostly just creepy sounding. It says, you're stuck. It freaked us both out. Never figured out where the call came from. Strangest, creepiest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Account 12. In my childhood home, I would often hear touch typing coming from the computer downstairs early in the mornings. I didn't think much of it at first. My parents worked from home, and it wouldn't be uncommon to wake up in the morning to hear mom typing away at the computer. One day, I got up and called out to mom, assuming she was down there working as I could hear typing. No answer. No one was down there at all. I was sure I heard typing. This began happening regularly. I figured I was so used to hearing typing from downstairs that I was hearing things that weren't there, so I didn't mention anything to anyone, figuring I was going a bit crazy. This happened on and off over a period of six months. The sound of fast typing and fast, furious clicking of a mouse as if someone was frustrated. One morning, I was eating my breakfast when I heard Mum at the top of the stairs call out to me, You're not down there on that computer already? I froze and ran out to her. I was amazed she had heard it too. She was convinced she could hear typing, yet no one was down there. I told her about all the times I'd been hearing it, and then my sister opened up about hearing it regularly too when no one was down there. I wasn't crazy after all. I set out to try to catch whatever was causing it and to try to discover a rational explanation for it. I'd sprint out of my bedroom to the top of the stairs where I was able to look down into the room to see if anyone was at the computer. No such luck, every time I got there it stopped. I think it went on for a couple of years, and we learned just to kind of live with it as it wasn't every day. I was down there once when the ceiling light globe in the center of the room began flashing very fast, strobe-like. It then exploded, and glass went shattering all across the room. I was lucky I ran out of the room when it started happening because I was scared. The whole mysterious typing, you know. If I hadn't run, I would have been hit with bits of light bulb. Around that same time, I was on the computer at home by myself when something happened that resulted in me never being alone in that room again. I felt and heard this really sharp intake of breath directly behind my right shoulder near my ear. I've never run so fast in my life and was hesitant about going in that room ever again. Prior to that, the whole typing thing had just been something weird and a bit spooky, not scary. Still makes my heart race when I think about it today. I have never really encountered anything like this before or since all those events. I don't particularly believe in ghosts either, but I'm open to the possibilities of something for which scientists don't have a proper explanation yet. TLDR Ghost was a proficient touch typer who had a breathing problem. Account 13. I'm a little late, but screw it. I was in first grade hanging out at recess with a friend. He was shooting some hoops outside and I was playing DS, sitting on the pavement. I remember him asking me if he could make a shot from halfway across the court. I told him he could try, but he probably wouldn't make it while looking at my DS. Suddenly my dad asks me what I mean, and when I look up, I'm sitting on my living room carpet talking to my dad, and it's dark out. I was sitting in the same position, playing the same game, same level, and same exact spot in the level. Everything continued normally that night, and I didn't tell anyone at the time, but looking back, it is really freaky. I thought it was a dream for the longest time, but thinking about it, it didn't really feel like a dream, and I don't really remember dreams that well. TLDR teleported through space and time once. Account 14. I was probably five years old, I was going to bed one evening, and I was overcome by the feeling that if I blinked, it would be the next morning. I blinked, and it was daylight. The night had passed immediately. I had the same feeling and tested the feeling for three straight nights. Then the feeling left, and it never again happened. Still remember it 30 years later. Account 15. Pretty sure I lived in a haunted house for a while. Strange things. For one, I always felt like I was being watched in my room, and if I had the door open to the hallway, I would swear I'd see someone walk by out of the corner of my eye. We had two cats, and sometimes they'd be in my room sleeping, and then all of a sudden, they would sit bolt upright and stare at the door, and nothing I did could move them for a long time. 
This happened often. One day in my bathroom, the shelf that had my sister's beauty stuff randomly lost hold of all the items. The thing was, the shelf wasn't loose or hanging, and all the stuff had to bounce out of a two-inch high lip into the sink. One time in the middle of the night, my sister's 100-plus-year-old dresser she got as a gift from our grandma just fell over. This thing weighed a ton, and it was built like a tank. Sister said she heard the sound of someone pushing. Mom and sister used to yell at me for sneaking around the house, only I wasn't home or I was in my room. They said they saw a man in shadows that was about my height. One day, we also ran into the old owner, and my mom casually asked the lady if she had ever experienced anything in the house. The lady started crying and said no one believed her, but yes, she experienced a lot of stuff. I moved out around that time. I do not miss that place. Account 1. My fiancé dealt with sleep paralysis for about a year a while back. It was fucking terrifying. Because of it now, anytime he makes weird noises, I instantly wake up. I was already a light sleeper and wake him up. There was once that he had fallen asleep on my couch. And I was sitting upright with my back on his stomach. He was sleeping on his side. And he started making very faint but frantic wheezing noises and swaying back and forth. But very gently. It took me a little while to feel it or to hear him. As soon as I did, I shook him awake. He said he had woken up but couldn't move or speak, really. My mom had been sitting on the couch across from us, and he said there was a shadowy figure that was next to her, and it kept creeping ever so slightly towards him, until the figure finally flew towards him. And that's when I finally felt him moving and woke him up. Account 2. I was sitting with friends on a beach one night really late, with no drugs or alcohol. We started to see something ambling down the beach toward us. As it got closer, but still like 50 yards away, we thought it was a skunk because of the way it moved. We all quietly watched as it came closer, and it became clear that something really strange was going on. It was a ball of light. It wasn't casting any light, but it was light. It wasn't glowing, and it was transparent. It moved like an ambling skunk, and at about that speed, and it was about that size. We all quietly confirmed with each other that we were all seeing this, and that we all felt an unnerving sense of doom. We sat very still. Then I realized that if I let my feeling of terror stop me from investigating this phenomenon, then I would forever have to wonder about it. I got up and walked slowly closer to it, and this feeling of dread and doom and the overwhelming urge to leave as quickly as possible started weighing heavier and heavier on me. But I'm really stubborn. It was my friends begging me to please stop and that we have to go that finally got me to turn around and go. I got within about six feet of it. It had stopped in front of us, and had seemed to acknowledge us in some strange ball-of-not-light kind of way. It didn't undulate or glow or anything you would expect light to do. I've had other odd experiences, and most of them I can sort of concede that they might be hallucinations or something else from my own brain. But this was different, and my friends felt the same thing. I've been baffled by it ever since. Count three. I hit a car in my company van and saw her baby splatter against the window. I got out and ran as fast as I could. The car was wrapped around the car seat like it was unbreakable. The rest of the car was trash. The baby was fine. I'm 100% certain that baby was a bloody mess all over the car. I saw it. I had blood on the window of my van when I got out. When I got back in to get the insurance camera, there was no blood. I've never understood it. Something shifted or my mind lied to me. Account 4. Seven years ago, I lived in a two-story farmhouse. It was built in 1908 and was both large and old. I was packing clothes and putting them in a small, unused bedroom. I was wearing my MP3 player, and the last time I checked, it showed three-fourths battery life. I was on my fourth or so trip and was hauling a load of shirts on hangers. It occurred to me the closet was empty, too. Perfect, I'll just hang them back up in there. This closet was almost a second room. It had a short, glossy wooden door. The area was thrice as long as wide with hardwood floors. The lacquer still smelled, even though I'm sure it was fresh a hundred years ago. I ducked fully inside and thought, this is a weird little place to be. Suddenly, the music doubled in volume and changed to something that wasn't music. It was like, I don't even know, rapid nonsense, fast electronic babbling. It scared the entire fuck out of me. I flew straight out, looked at my player, and it was dead. I'm a pretty rational guy. That MP3 player would sometimes show more battery life than it actually had. It's done that before. And maybe the sounds were some sort of malfunction before shutting down. I don't really believe in ghosts, but I'm telling you, it shocked and frightened me to the core. 
My skin felt electric for an hour after. I never felt comfortable in that room again. TLDR entered a creepy closet. MP3 player screamed gibberish and died. Account 5. I know I'm a bit late, but I have a good story for this. So a few years back, probably six, seven years, my family was living in our previous home. This was our second house we had in Ohio. The first house was about two streets over from our second house. Well, one night my mom woke me up and was acting really panicked. She grabbed my brother, who was probably five at the time, and told me to go outside. It was about four in the morning, and once we all got outside, my dad tried to calm my mom down. He asked her what was wrong, and she had explained that she had a dream that we were all going to die from carbon monoxide poisoning if we stayed in the house. Then my dad told her that all the detectors were working perfectly fine, and we decided to go back inside. We didn't smell anything, nor did the detectors go off, so we went to bed. The next day, my mom was watching the morning news before we went to school. The first story for the day was that a local family was rushed out of their home because of a carbon monoxide leak in their home, which could have been just coincidence, but then the news station showed the house. It was our old house that we just moved out of. There are actually a few stories that are pretty supernatural that I have about my family, but this is the shortest one, to be honest. Account 6. So I was staying at my aunt's house in Mexico. My cousin's room had two beds, so I slept in there. I remember not being able to sleep well, and I had a bit of pain coming from my thighs. I had sweatpants on and somehow had scratches on my inner thighs, almost like a bunch of cat scratches. My aunt came in and searched the bed for anything, but never found anything that could have scratched me. She also noticed that I had a bit of bruising on my neck as if someone had tried to choke me. It was just me and my cousin, definitely freaked me out, and I rarely ever go visit my aunt anymore. If I do, I stay for a few minutes only. Sorry for bad formatting, I'm on mobile. Account 7. After my grandpa died, my grandma said she could feel someone getting into bed with her nearly every night. But we didn't believe her. One night I was watching TV in the living room trying to fall asleep when I heard footsteps in the hallway leading to my grandma's bedroom. I looked out into the hallway and couldn't see anyone, and this happened for probably a minute. Immediately after the footsteps stopped, the TV turned off. I stayed awake for another hour or so, but didn't hear anything after that. Account 8. The house I grew up in was about 100 years old by the time my parents bought it. I lived there until I was 16. For as long as I can remember, I saw what I described as a girl that was pink and see-through. I always called her Pam. It has been 10 years since I lived in that house, and I still remember her vividly. My dad got a bit weirded out when I would talk about Pam. And finally, when I was 13, my mom put me in therapy because Pam was still something I brought up regularly. In order to stop my parents from thinking I was crazy, I just stopped talking about Pam completely and went on with life. That was until my parents decided to put the house up for sale when I was 16. Just two weeks before moving into our new house... I was sleeping, but was woken up by Pam standing in my doorway and pointing into the bathroom that was directly across the hall. All Pam said was, look, my mom. And when I looked to see who she was pointing at, I saw a woman hanging by a cord from the light fixture in the bathroom. I remember the woman looked as though she had been hanging there for a while, when all of a sudden the woman's boot fell off and I abruptly woke up. I ran into my parents' room to tell them what happened, and my mom looked at me disappointed because I was talking about Pam again after having kept quiet about her for years. I concluded that it was just a bad dream and went back to bed with no other incidences. Until a few days later, I was once again asleep and dreaming that I was woken up by crying coming from the bathroom across the hall. I got out of bed and walked over to see what was going on. At that point, I saw the same woman that was hanging from the bathroom light fixture, sobbing and holding a very real little girl under the water in the bathtub. It was then that I realized that the little girl was the little pink see-through girl I had seen my entire life. It was Pam, and she was not moving. I immediately woke up and I was crying uncontrollably. I was 16 years old, and I ran into my parents' room like a five-year-old and jumped into bed with my mom. My dad was working at the time. I told my mom what had happened, and my mom could see how upset I was and was trying to calm me down. At that same moment, the pink and transparent version of Pam walked through the door. I looked at my mom and just whispered, Oh my God, Mom, she's in here, and I pulled the covers up to my neck and just looked at my mom terrified. My mom was speechless. At that point, 
Pam slowly walked up the side of the bed and began shoving me into my mom. I had never been touched by Pam before. I was screaming and crying and kept yelling, stop touching me. And all that my mom could reply was, I'm not touching you, as she was being pushed out of the other side of the bed. After what seemed like forever, Pam stopped and slowly walked out of the room. I cried myself to sleep, and my mom stayed awake to see what else would happen. I never spent another night in that house. But two weeks after we moved out completely, the house caught fire. The entire backside as well as the entire garage burnt. The official cause was spontaneous combustion. The house that my family lived in for 25 years has since been bought and sold eight times within 10 years. No one wants to stay in that house, and I really think that Pam is the reason why. Account 9. TLDR. That sinking feeling you get when you think someone unseen is watching you is not always wrong. Hunter Mountaineer here. It was a chilly December morning. I hiked in pre-dawn, taking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trails. Got to my nest about half an hour before sunrise and started to settle in. The wind kicked up and a fog rolled in that was thicker than milk. Within a few minutes, my visibility was five. I'm sitting tight, huddled up against the freezing wind when I start to hear twigs snapping close to me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound indicative of an imminently successful hunt sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around in my lever action 30-30 as quietly as I could and lay flat on my back tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peek over the mountains to my east, and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or beside me. I remember laying there, rifle across my chest, thinking to myself how silly it was to react like such a coward. I reasoned with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity where I was, and I had likely stumbled into a herd of whitetail that had bedded down. I decided to sit up. The rustling stopped immediately. As it was fully dawn by now, I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally all around me. It wasn't. Seemingly nothing was. By now the fog had faded away, and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. I hunted all that day without seeing so much as a squirrel. Around three in the afternoon, after fighting the wind and an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike out by flashlight, I decided it was time to start back to the truck. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I have ever felt. Lawfully, once you make it back to the trail, you are supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle. Not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods, I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop and listen. I never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could feel eyes on me. I was about a hundred feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner and saw, hanging at eye level from a tree by a noose, a stuffed bear in a blaze orange jacket. I'm a giant broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me something fierce. Account 10. I was once sitting on the couch with my boyfriend and heard the words, I love you. And then my boyfriend goes, I love you too. I was so utterly confused. I was not the one who said, I love you. My mouth was shut. I remember hearing and feeling the vibrations of words and sound being produced, but I was not the one who did it, and he was not either. It sounded like a feminine voice. It sounded like it came from right in front of my face, but no one was outside the window or in the room with us. It was creepy as hell. I still think about it. Account 11. A week ago tomorrow, I came home from class at around 11.30 and no one else was home. I hung out at home for a bit, and at 2.30, I was overcome with sleepiness. Being the bum that I am, I laid down in my bed and set a timer on my phone for a 20-minute nap. I fell asleep quickly, and after around five minutes, I was woken up by my bedroom door opening and had a split second of panic before my dog jumping up onto my bed and laying down next to me. I fell back asleep. After another five minutes of sleep, I instantly jolted awake because I was certain there was someone standing next to my bed behind me. I assumed it was my mother, who would likely be pissed that I was sleeping in the middle of the day. I woke and turned around in one movement, and there was no one there. Weird. I checked my phone and had another eight minutes of sleep left. I went back to sleep, only to be woken by my phone ringing. It was my mother. 
She said that my great aunt, who had been in the hospital after a stroke-like event for a week, had died around one o'clock. My mom then said she knew my aunt was going to die today because she had seen a wraith, a sort of ghost, usually warning of someone dying that morning. My mom is Scottish and very superstitious, but I do not believe in any of that. She said that when she woke up that morning to take my brother to school, she went into my room to see if I was still asleep. She saw a wraith standing next to my bed. My brain shit itself. Account 12. My ex-wife and I bought an older house from the 1930s. We were renovating and had put some baseboards into the basement, painted them, and left them to dry overnight. We looked at them the next morning, and it looked like someone had taken a sharp knife and dug it down the entire length of two of the baseboards, almost eight feet each. The blade had gouged through the new paint, old paint, primer, and right down to the wood. It was just the two of us in the house. Count 13. My family moved into an old house, 200 plus years old, when I was 10. My uncle, a weird guy, was going to help us move in. And when we got inside the house, he got all weird and left. He always avoided coming for birthdays, etc. We always joked that he saw a ghost, and for some reason we nicknamed the ghost Billy. When my little sister started talking, she would say really weird things, like asking if we can shut her door at night so she doesn't have to see the boy walking down the hallway. Fucking creepy. Anyways, we thought she was also just being a big weirdo, so we continued to have this Billy the Ghost joke. Something would get misplaced. Must be Billy, yada yada. A few years later, we ripped up the flooring because we wanted to go back to the original hardwood that had been covered up forever ago by old owners. And if you know anything about old houses, you know they used to insulate the floor with newspaper when newspaper just became a thing. We decided to read some articles for fun, some talking about the first ever refrigerators, really cool things like that. Until we got to the creepy part, a mentally challenged boy named Billy, who lived in our home, died while playing outside of it. I saw a lot of shit growing up in that house, but I am not a huge ghost believer. The newspaper was a fucking creepy coincidence, though, given that for years we had an ongoing Billy the Ghost joke. My uncle also ended up telling us years later that when he pulled into the driveway and was outside of the house, he just got this awful feeling. Account 14. When I was little, I would go over to my grandparents' house frequently with my sister and cousins. My grandparents have an attached mother-in-law apartment, so we always played in there while the grown-ups would talk in the main house. One day, we were playing hot and cold with a little key we found in the apartment. While one person was hiding it, they accidentally dropped it, and it fell under the door to the basement. I opened the door to get it, and when I did, there was a man standing at the bottom of the stairs that I didn't recognize. He had a bunch of stuff in his arms like he had rummaged through my grandparents' basement. Keep in mind, my grandparents were hoarders. Their basement was full of stuff that they either forgot about or put in storage, some of it being relatively valuable. When he saw me, he yelled at me, Go back upstairs, kid, go! I was so freaked out, I bolted and immediately ran into the main house to tell my parents. My dad went into the basement to look, but couldn't find anyone. To this day, they all tell me I imagined it, but my sister and cousins insist it's real too. About five years later, both of my grandparents passed away, so I was helping my dad clean out their basement. Turns out they were missing a ton of stuff. I haven't gone back in that house since. Account 15. I used to date a girl in college who lived three hours away. We would trade weekends, one at her school, one at my school. One day she got upset because she had driven all the way to see me, and I was in an all-night study session, which she had known about, and couldn't be home to see her. She texted me that she was going back to her place, and then I never heard anything from her ever again. After three days of texting her trying to make sure she was okay, the texts started coming back as, Number not found. I sent her the stuff she had left at my apartment in the mail, and it returned as, no forwarding address. Her instant messenger account, which I never messaged but knew the name of, disconnected. And it gets weirder. I called her apartment landline and was told the people who had lived there had moved out. She had three roommates and didn't leave a number as to where they went. I got really freaked out and asked friends who worked in school admin to pull some strings, just to make sure she was alive. The school she was at didn't have any records of her as a student. The license plate to her car wasn't registered to anyone. None of our mutual friends ever saw her again. I called the police, but there were no car accidents involving anyone who fit her description in the stretch of road between our two schools that night or in the two weeks after, 
I didn't ask for a longer time frame because at that point she was already missing. Cops wouldn't file a missing person because I wasn't a family member. To this day, I have no idea what happened, why she freaked out on me so bad, or if she's still alive or in witness protection or was erased from all time by an evil wizard. She literally disappeared without a trace. Account 1. Fell asleep in the bath once as a teenager. Woke up in a darkened version of the room with the water line just below my nose. Couldn't move, couldn't make noise. Tried to call for my dad. Got a mumble out. Dad arrived, but as he opened the door and stooped in, he seemed to be about nine feet tall. Wrapped in ragged towels and had a mummified face. He reached out towards my chest as if to suck the life out of me, like you said, like a dementor. It felt like the creature was definitely my father for some reason, despite no one being home. Thankfully, this has only happened to me once. I don't think I could deal with it being a regular thing like it is for some people. Account 2. When I was about 15 years old, I lived in a house that was about 120 years old. The whole thing was huge, but was divided up into apartments in the 50s. The apartment my mom and I lived in had this really long and narrow bathroom, and at the end of it was this closet space. Well, about a week after we moved in, we unlocked it. With a skeleton key and everything, and both my mother and I immediately got really sick. Like bending over the bathtub and toilet, puking our guts out. Our dog wouldn't go near it. Just walking into the bathroom sent chills and goosebumps up your spine. After a month of avoiding it, I got fed up and decided to try it again when my mom was at work. I turned the key and went inside. The windows had been painted over and there were old, rusty nails sticking out of the walls everywhere. Super weird even without the chilly draft that was in there, despite it being summer. I looked around for a minute to see if I could find anything really crazy to show my mom later because old houses sometimes have hidden treasures, and then the door slammed behind me and locked itself, which could only be done with the old as shit key that was in my hand. Scariest shit ever. There was zero light, it was cold as shit, and my dog was losing his effing mind. The scariest part was the key wouldn't work at all. I tried probably 30 times to unlock it to no avail. Every other time before and after the incident, it worked just fine. Finally, after about 30 minutes of being locked in there and crying my eyes out, my mom came home and called over a neighbor to get the door down. The handle would not give, so they ended up having to take it off its hinges. We ended up living there for about a year, and every time I went in that bathroom, I'd avoid even looking at that closet. I get creeped out just thinking about it. Ah! Count three. This happened three times with three different people. I grew up in a two-story house in the Philippines. Upstairs, there was a huge playroom and four bedrooms. When I was around 11 years old, my babysitter and I were hanging out in the playroom. She went to the bathroom, and I got bored, so I went downstairs to check out the fridge. I heard her come out of the bathroom, and she started screaming my name. After the third time, she stopped. I thought she figured out that I was downstairs. After a few minutes, I saw her coming down the stairs. As she looked at me, she froze and just stared at me. I asked her what's wrong, and she said she just saw me in the playroom before she went downstairs. She was really freaked out about it, and I don't know, I used to not believe in these things, so I just laughed at her. The second time it happened, I was probably 16. I was hanging out in my brother's room because it had the fastest internet. Then I heard my six-year-old brother, I have two brothers calling me and looking around for me. I didn't answer back and just waited for him to find me. I saw him go into my room, and then he got quiet. I thought he was looking for something and just found it. As he was walking out of my room, he saw me in my brother's room, and he just froze and stared like my babysitter. I asked him what's wrong, and he said, Why are there two of you? That's when I freaked out and ran to my mom's room. She laughed at us, but I remember sleeping in her room that night. The last time it happened was when I was 20. My parents went on vacation with my youngest brother, so my other siblings and I had to stay at my grandparents' house. The first night they were away, my sister and I decided to go home and get more clothes. We were both in my room because she likes to borrow some of my clothes, and I told her that I'm going to take a shower. That's when she left and went to her room to pack more clothes. I went to the bathroom and started brushing my teeth. As I was about to get in the shower, my sister walked into the bathroom and she looked at me so weirdly. Her face turned pale, so I asked her what's wrong. She said she went back to my room and was talking to me, but then she had to pee, so she went to the bathroom and found me there. 
We both looked at each other, grabbed our stuff, and left. I still don't know why or what it is, but it still creeps me out when I think about it. Account 4. My story was more like a glitch in the Matrix, but still was pretty creepy. I'm really skeptical when it comes to various paranormal activities, but one thing happened a couple of years ago that I can't rationally explain. So my father was picking me up from the airport. We got into the car, started driving home. Then I remembered I left my small bag in the airport toilet, so we went back, parked our car at the guarded multi-level parking. We locked it, obviously, even if we didn't. It locks itself after 30 seca. When we came back, we found a tiny basket with raspberries in it on the driver's seat. My father was sitting there four minutes ago, obviously. We had no idea how the hell did they appear there. He didn't buy them? I didn't bring them with me. There was only one entrance to the parking, guarded by the parking guard, and he said nobody entered or left when we were gone. This story is now legendary among my family, and nobody can explain it. Sorry for my English, not my first language, obviously. Out 5. My wife and I were asleep one night, and I woke up suddenly and felt like someone was at the foot of our bed. I opened my eyes and saw a woman standing there who looked just like this at the foot of my bed. She slowly turned towards me and just stared. Not being fully awake yet, my brain couldn't get fully afraid, but was instead curious and confused as to why there was another person in the room. I sat up and reached toward the woman, trying to figure out if she was real or not. When my hand reached her face, she disappeared. My wife woke up at this point and asked me what I was doing. All I could say was that I thought I saw something. We both laid back down facing each other and closed our eyes. Not a minute later, we both heard this guttural roar, growl that sounded like a mix between a bear, lion, and howler monkey emanating from behind our headboard. There's nothing behind that wall since it's an outside second story wall. She immediately began screaming and I searched the house from top to bottom. We never found out what made that noise. It took us a while to sleep in our bedroom again. Count six. Twelve years ago, my brother died, and for that whole first year, a lot of super weird shit happened to our family. The only conclusion I can come to, and I do really believe this, was that he was trying to contact us. A week after his funeral, my mom was home by herself, and the phone rang. This was about 2 p.m. The caller ID said that it was my brother's house, so she figured it was my sister-in-law. Mom answered, and when she said hello, there was no sound on the other end, and no one answered. She said hello, again, and still no answer. Then the call disconnected. She waited till about 6 p.m. when my sister-in-law came home from work, and she called her to ask if she had come home from work and called her earlier. My sister-in-law said no. She asked if the kids had come home early. My sister-in-law asked my niece and nephew if they had come home to call Gran in the middle of the day, and neither of them had. They were in school the whole time until the end of the day. The phone was mounted to the kitchen wall, and the receiver was on the hook, so it is not like the dog knocked it over and accidentally stepped on speed dial. We think it was my brother making contact to let my mom know he was around. My sister-in-law is an amazing cook, and she has many kitchen utensils and tools that are very specialized, that you only use for one thing. For example, a certain knife you would only use for fish or some such thing. Over the course of that first year he was gone, Many of the utensils that my sister-in-law would use to make my brother's favorite dishes started to disappear. She did not loan them out. No one borrowed them. I asked a friend of mine who was really into the supernatural about it. She said, does your sister-in-law believe in ghosts and such? I said, no. She is super no-nonsense and really does not believe. She said, that is the problem. He is trying to get her attention. He wants her to talk to him. He misses her. He is trying to let her know that he is still around. A year after my brother died, my dad's lady friend's father died. And a year after that, she was still having a lot of problems coping with her dad's death, so she went to a psychic to see if she could make contact with him. So the psychic tells her all the things she wants to hear. Yes, of course, your dad is in the room, etc., etc. Stuff that anyone could say to her. Then the psychic says, your dad is here. But there is a much younger man with him also. He is very tall and thin, with dark hair and glasses. Normally, Dad's lady friend would have thought of my brother. But she was having such a hard time coping with the loss of her dad that she just did not make the connection to my brother at that exact moment. So she said, that does not sound like anyone I know. The psychic said, 
Who is James? Dad's lady friend said, He is my companion. The psychic said, The younger man has a message for James. He said, Please tell my dad that I am okay. She realized it was my brother trying to get a message to my dad. The psychic knew nothing about my brother's death. Dad's lady friend was strictly there to talk about her father. Two months after my brother died, I was kind of having a really bad day about his death. It was still very soon, and I was still grieving. I went out to Target in my neighborhood to run some errands, Sunday morning, very early, right when they opened, and on this particular day, I had my hair up in a ponytail. I was going up the escalator to the second level, and suddenly I felt someone tug my ponytail, just in a friendly manner, like you would tap someone on the shoulder. There was one girl I worked with who lived in my neighborhood, and I thought that early on a Sunday in this neighborhood, it could only be her. So I turned around, expecting to see my co-worker behind me with a big grin on her face. And I was alone. I was alone on the escalator. There was no one else on there with me, and the store was still mostly empty. Nine months after he died, I was in bed sleeping, and it had to be around 3 a.m. or so. Suddenly, I felt someone sit on the edge of my mattress. I actually felt the weight of this person sit down. I felt the edge of the mattress dip. I gasped because naturally I figured someone had broken into my bedroom and was going to attack me or something. I was laying on my stomach, and before I could roll over and see who it was, I felt this person lean up against me, very gently, like they were trying to hug me without waking me up, and rest their cheek on my hair. I could not see anything, but at that point I bolted upright and screamed and snapped on the light. There was no one there. You guys, I swear on my life, to this day, I could feel this person lightly hugging me. I could feel their cheek against my hair. I felt the mattress dip down when they sat. It has been 12 years since he died, and to this day there has been no way to explain any of this. Sorry this was so long for my first post, but when I saw the topic, I could not help but register so I could post. Account 7. I posted this a long time ago. But when I was younger, my mom was dating this guy, who we will call JB, and after a few months, he invited my mom, me, and my brother to go with him and his son, about my age, out to his lake house for the weekend. It was right on Lake Michigan, but up in a more secluded area, which was pretty awesome. Well, we got up there, and for one, I already felt really creeped out. It was a smaller two, maybe three if you count the really big attic, story house that had the living room, dining room, kitchen on the first floor and had two bedrooms on the second floor. His grandfather had helped to build the place with his, the grandfather's dad, and then he lived there for most of his life, working as a tailor in the nearby town. We went up to the attic to get some beach toys because that is where JB kept all of that stuff, so he did not have to haul it every time he went out there. Well, when we went up to the attic, I noticed in the corner, covered in some dust and cobwebs, about eight mannequins, some just upper torsos and some full body. Not too out of the ordinary, considering a tailor had lived there. JB's son and I slept down in the living room on the couch since there were no more beds, and near midnight-ish, I heard one of the stairs squeak a few times. Figuring it was my mom coming to check to make sure we were asleep, I told his son to be quiet and quickly turned the TV off and hid under the covers. After not hearing any noise for a few minutes, I looked out from under the covers and saw three of the mannequins moving around in the kitchen. Like their body parts were not moving, but they were sliding around the kitchen. I swore I was dreaming, but was so terribly frightened, I hid back under the covers with a small yelp, and then heard the dragging on the floor coming closer and peeked out seeing one of them just a few feet from the couch. I hid back under the covers and shut my eyes tight, hoping it would go away. The next morning, I got up and tried not to think about it, really. Really hoping it was just a bad dream. But when we went back up to the attic to put the beach stuff back, the mannequins were in different spots and were not covered in cobwebs anymore. Do not believe me if you do not want to. But it happened. And I have been scared shitless of mannequins ever since. Count eight. This is ongoing and only happens when I am home alone. About five months ago, I got home from work at about 10 p.m. And to enter the living room, you have to walk past the basement stairs. I did so without actually looking straight down them, but had full vision of them. There was a huge brown head at the bottom of the stairs opening and closing its mouth. 
I took about five steps past the stairs before it caught up with me, and then I was scared that it was a person in my basement. I called a friend of mine to come over. She did, and we did not find anything down there. All the doors were locked, nothing had been moved. A few months after that, I was watching TV upstairs before work. I heard a noise like something had been thrown across the room in the basement. I froze for a second, looked around, and saw that all my pets were in the same room as me. I called my friend again, told her to stay on the line as I checked out the basement. All the doors were locked, nothing was moved. I have heard that noise. It sounds like someone is throwing something large and heavy at the wall about five more times and still have not figured out what it is. I have not seen the face again, but I always feel someone watching me when I am in the kitchen, which is at the top of the stairs. Account 9. Stationed in Erlangen, Germany between 1990 and 1993, but lived off post in Nuremberg. Lived in a condominium on Dusseldorfer Strasse with my then wife and two daughters. My oldest daughter, three years old at the time, would often come running into our bedroom crying and complaining of a monkey in her room. She didn't have any toys of monkeys or apes, so it was kind of baffling to understand her fear. Their bedroom and ours were across from each other in the hallway, and we could see directly into their bedroom from ours. One late night, sitting up in bed reading, I caught movement out of my right side. Thinking one of my kids may be up, I walked to their room, but they were both asleep. I went back to my bed and book, and again I noticed movement. So I glanced over to their room from my bed, and that's when I saw what appeared to be the outline of a child as it walked into the bedroom where my daughters were sleeping. I launched out of my bed and covered the distance between my room and theirs in maybe four leaps. Nothing. My daughters were both sleeping. This was mid-tour for me, so for the remaining year and a half, we all slept in our room. Account 10. One winter night, I took a walk to a park in my town and saw a guy sleeping on the ground. Even though it was very cold out, I didn't think to call an ambulance. I had never seen him before, so I just kind of stood there and watched the guy sleep for a moment and moved on. A week later, I read in the papers that he died from the cold that night. The paper said his name and that he was homeless for a while. I felt really guilty but eventually forgot about him. A few months later, I get a letter in the mail from a local hospital addressed to him. It turns out that he used my address when he was at the hospital for some reason. I turned white. Account 11. So when I was 13 or early 14, I was walking home from the library to the bus stop. A bit away from where my stop was, I saw an old man lying on the grass like he had fallen there. It was right next to a skate park, but nobody was paying attention to him. I went up to him, crouched down, and asked if he was okay. No, he replied. Do you need medical help? I asked. Yes. Do you want me to call 911? I want to make sure you're okay. Yes. I ran and asked to borrow a phone from someone at the skate park to call 911. The dispatcher sent an ambulance, and they told me to keep him aware and awake. Hi, my name is Nature Spawn. I just called the ambulance, so they will get here soon, okay? What do you like to do? Looking back, I imagine I looked a bit funny. A little 13-year-old girl with dyed blue hair, a trench coat, and steampunk goggles crouching next to a guy lying on the ground. Anyway, the ambulance came, I said goodbye, and I headed to the bus stop. While I was walking towards it, I started getting harassed by two older smoking people for bothering homeless people and being a disgrace to humanity. I suffered from low self-confidence at that point in time, so tears were starting to gather in my eyes. Eventually, I just walked away, and after a moment's thought, I flipped them off as I walked away. Looking back at this, I'm really glad something like what you just wrote did not happen to me. Account 12. I worked at a small-town pizza shop during my winter breaks in college. I was good friends with a married couple who picked up occasional shifts to supplement the income from their regular jobs. One time, we were swapping spooky stories, and they told me about one that had happened just a week earlier. The wife had been spending the evening visiting her sister way out in the country when a heavy snowstorm rolled in. The roads were slippery and visibility was terrible as she was driving home. At one point, it was so bad she didn't even see the railroad crossing until the lights started flashing and the gate almost crashed onto her hood. Luckily, she managed to skid to a stop barely in front of the tracks right before the train came roaring by. When she got home, she was still shaken up 
and told her husband about the close call with the train and how the gate had almost crashed on the hood of her car. The next morning, her husband told her he wanted to show her something, and they went driving back towards her sister's house until they got to the railroad crossing. All that was there was an old-fashioned crossing sign. There were no lights and no gates. Account 1. Here are some tips that I gave a while back if you want to better understand and prevent sleep paralysis. I've experienced sleep paralysis quite a few times. I can also induce it to some degree, so I think I can help. Starting off, you should probably look at the position you sleep in. Sleep position can play a large role in causing or preventing sleep paralysis. The most common position in which people are susceptible to sleep paralysis is when they are lying flat on their back. I usually sleep on my belly or my side, but if I ever want to induce sleep paralysis for lucid dreaming, astral projecting shenanigans, I sleep on my back with my neck resting on a pillow. Most of the time this ends in me getting sleep paralysis. If you normally sleep like this, I would recommend trying out a new position to sleep in. If this isn't the case and you sleep on your belly, the next step is to fight back against the actual sleep paralysis while it's happening. My first recommendation would be to use sensory deprivation. If you sleep with your face and eyes exposed, I would recommend pulling the covers over your face while you sleep. This helps minimize the likelihood of a visual hallucination and also helps cut back on physical hallucinations, like feeling someone breathing on your face. With fewer outlets exposed through which you can process hallucinations, your paralysis episodes will be much less vivid and frightening. However, sometimes even with all these precautions, you may still succumb to sleep paralysis. Once this is happening, it is extremely important to recognize that you are paralyzed. If you can't lift your chest, move your arms, or move your head, you're obviously paralyzed. The first thing you should do once you realize that you are paralyzed is to not open your eyes. You may continue to hear things and feel bodily sensations, but at least you won't see them. For example, one time while paralyzed, I felt nails dragging across my face and the covers being pulled off me. I'm glad I didn't see something scary on top of that. Now that you're paralyzed and you recognize it, start working to escape it and wake up. The real trick to waking up from sleep paralysis is to focus on one simple part of your body, like a toe, and start trying to wiggle it. It will be still at first, but keep trying. Focus entirely on doing this repeatedly until you finally move your finger. When your finger eventually does move, you'll be awake and the scary hallucinations will have subsided. Well, that's about it for now. This process works for me every single time I get sleep paralysis and has really taken the fear of it away from me. I now see it as a cool experience at best and a minor inconvenience at worst. I hope this helped, and feel free to ask me if you have any more questions. Krusty White Sock. Count two. My oldest sister used to sleepwalk and talk a lot, and it used to scare the ever-loving heck out of me. Being about eight at the time when we shared a room, I would lie still, staring at the ceiling late at night, hearing her mumble and talk incoherently. She didn't sound like my sister, and I hated it. Once, she even got up at about three in the morning and began dressing for school, completely asleep. I had to gently wake her while trying not to freak out. Of course, now I look back and it's hilarious. One night, as I dreamt, I felt a heavy weight bearing down on my chest. I opened my eyes to see my sister, with that glazed look in her eyes, holding a pillow on my chest and putting all of her weight onto it. As I came to terms with what was happening, I freaked out and told her to get off me. This was after possibly a year of creepy sleep stuff and eight-year-old me had snapped. Her eyes popped open, she looked around and said, What's happening? She then proceeded to walk sleepily back to her bed and cuddle into the pillow she nearly murdered her sister with. Yeah, we don't talk much now. Account 3. This gave me chills. New Orleans is my other home, so to speak. And of the many times I have been there, it always seems like something strange happens. Be it something like that or just small coincidences that do not happen where I currently reside. I remember when I was 14 and seeing the city from the causeway for the first time and I just got this really strange feeling. There's just something about the city. Oh, and by the way, my best friend is from there, and she's pretty level-headed, but she tightens her mouth when Voodoo Hoodoo comes up and says not to ever mess with it. She won't tell me the story of her trying whatever she was trying, but she's adamant about it. Account 4. A friend of mine's house burnt to the ground when I was younger, and his family moved across the street to a house that they rented for a bit. 
The basement in said rented house was unfinished, so being middle schoolers, we decided we would use the basement to ride skateboards and scooters. So after one night of skateboarding, we headed upstairs to watch scary movies and pass out. Neither of his parents nor his sister were home. They went to his grandparents for the night, if I remember correctly. As we were getting close to sleep, we heard something hit the ground really hard on the concrete of the basement. So being dumb teenagers, we decided to investigate. As we opened the door to the basement and peered down, we just saw a skateboard floating mid-air. We sat and watched for a few seconds, and then it dropped suddenly and very violently. Needless to say, we packed our stuff up and sprinted back to my house. Not much sleeping happened that night. His family moved out soon after, and we tend to avoid that house as much as possible. Account 5. I am way late to the party, but I made an account just for this thread. Several years ago, I had an overnight babysitting gig. At about 11 p.m., I would arrive at my client's house as they were leaving for work. Their son was only nine and already asleep long before I showed up, and all I had to do was sleep in the guest room. Since he was under 13, he could not be alone in the house, so I was just around to make sure the place didn't burn down, essentially. Pretty sweet gig. The only downside was that the house wasn't in too great of a neighborhood. One night, a few nights before Halloween, I get a call from the mom saying she has to leave a few hours early, asking if I could come in ASAP. I was on the other side of town, but could easily be there in about 45 minutes. She had to leave right away, so the kid was going to be alone for about 35, 40 minutes. But since it was kind of a dire situation, she said it was fine. It never happened before or after, so it wasn't a big deal. So, I drive across town and make in to their place in decent time. And as I am parked in front of the house and gathering my things to take inside, I see a cat out of the corner of my vision. As I am getting out, this cat starts rubbing my legs, weaving in and out of them and following me as I begin up the walk. Now this family didn't have a cat. The son was super allergic, and I'd never seen him before, even after working there for over a year, but I didn't think much of it at the time. As I walk past the gate in their front fence, this painter's van pulls up. You know the ones. White, no windows, super sketchy. The back door opens, and these two guys kind of hop out and ask me for directions to the nearest gas station. I point them where to go, down two blocks, over four, and the guy driving rolls down his window and asks if I could just hop in and show him. Remember the cat? He fucking zooms out from behind me, runs under the fence, and starts doing that horrible shrieking noise cats make when they are engaged in battle in the dead of night right outside your goddamned window. The cat doesn't stop. This fluffy little bastard fucking jumps one of the guys, climbs his leg like a fucking tree, and starts clawing the ever-loving shit out of him. The guy freaks, obviously, starts screaming, and he and his buddy dive for cover in the van, speeding off with the doors still open. Then, like it was the normalest thing ever, the cat walks right back up the pathway and comes to sit at my feet. I pet him, kind of scared I was gonna be next but he just takes his ear scratches and purrs from me before bounding off toward the backyard. Weirdest shit, right? I honestly thought I was crazy, so I tried to push it from my mind. Yeah, well, it gets fucked up. About a week later, a woman around my age build ends up missing, and local reports mentioned seeing a white, unmarked painter's van in the neighborhood. Of course I called the cops, and they came and took my statement, but I never heard anything back about it. I left out the part with the cat in my story, but I've always secreted attributed my safety that night to the strange cat. I never saw him in the neighborhood again either. Account 6. So this happened about a month ago. I live alone, and it is extremely rare that I ever feel nervous about being alone late at night. Well, one night I just had this incredibly uneasy feeling. So much, in fact, that even though I'm a smoker, I decided not to smoke before bed like usual. I checked the locks on all my windows and doors before going to bed. I laid down in the bed, but still couldn't shake this uneasy feeling. I got up and grabbed my pistol, a revolver, and placed it, still in the holster, on my nightstand next to the bed. I eventually fell asleep, and all was good. Until I woke up the next morning and noticed my pistol sitting on the dresser. I thought, well, that's weird. 
I got up and went over to get the gun and realized that all of the bullets were missing. Since I live alone, I always keep it loaded, but the bullets were missing. I went and grabbed the box of ammo from the closet and exactly five shells, the shells I used to load the revolver, were missing. At this point, I'm freaking out either thinking that I had maybe woke up in the middle of the night and unloaded the gun or something like that. Well, I had to get my day started, so I went and made some coffee. I needed to empty the garbage and took the bag outside to the can. As I start walking around the house, I freeze instantly. All five bullets are scattered on the ground on the back side of my house. The weirdest part is that I hadn't left my house at all the previous day and all the windows were locked when I checked them the night before. Count seven. I was driving home from vacation and it was late. I was tired, but I didn't feel like I was going to fall asleep. All of a sudden I heard a voice say, wake up, and instantly I snapped awake with a feeling like I just had a good rest. I was wide awake. Turns out I was falling asleep at the wheel. Windy roads would have been fatal, most likely. Voice didn't sound like anyone's I knew, but whoever, whatever it was, saved my life that day. Account 8. We just moved all the way from the West Coast to the Midwest. We had trouble finding a place to stay since we had such a huge family, so one of our uncles lets us stay in the other half of his duplex. It was a two-story giant house. Anyway, we, the kids, were playing in the basement at like 1, 2 a.m. and we see this door that we never noticed before. We dared each other to open it, but no one would since we were all scared. The next morning, we told my grandfather about the room. He goes in the basement and open up the door, which was just a small room. But I remember it being really dark in there. The only light that came into the room were the small amount of light from us opening the door. He takes a look into the room and I remember him saying, you stay right there. Not talking to me, of course. He got my father and they quickly went to the farmers and got a chicken. My grandfather was a traditional shaman, so he respectfully gave thanks to the chicken and killed it. The chicken blood was collected into a bowl. He got his shaman hat and finger bells. He put the hat, which covers his entire face, and proceed to open the door. With the finger bells one in each hand and the bowl of chicken blood, he goes in there and says some incantation and place the chicken blood in the room. He comes out and closes the door. Then he starts doing his chants, and you hear the bowl moving. It had this spinning kind of sound to it, and when it finally stops, my grandfather opens the door again. As his chants gets louder, it also echoes more. We weren't allowed to see what happened in that room during the exchange, but his finger bell sounded like he was walking into a corner. He comes out with the bowl that had a small amount of chicken blood left and what looked like a little hand-stitched doll with red twine around it in the bowl soaked. I remember clearly the little doll was soaked in the blood. He takes a match and lights the doll on fire in the bowl. He tells my father to make sure to bring it outside and don't let the fire die out until he gets outside. I still don't know how the bowl with the chicken blood was on fire. I doubt chicken blood would catch on fire, so the only thing I could think of was the doll. Once my father left, I got a look into the room and you can faintly see that most of the chicken blood splattered around the room. We had to clean it up later with flashlights because the room was so dark and the blood was smeared all over the walls. A few days later, in the middle of the night, I hear my mother and father panicking. There was a ton of smoke in the house. We went out of the room to check up what was happening, and my father was running back and forth from the bathroom to get the pail of water to where the smoke was coming from. My mother gathered all of us outside and called the fire department. We all got outside except my grandfather was nowhere to be found. My dad quickly ran back into the duplex, and what seemed like a few hours came out carrying my grandfather on his back. Somehow my grandfather had his shaman hat on, which puzzled me. I asked my father a few years ago after grandfather had passed away about where he found grandfather. My dad said the smoke was coming from near the basement stairs. He found my grandfather in a deep trance facing a wall. He quickly got my grandfather out of the trance and carried him out. It was weird since the firefighters said the fire must have suffocated itself to death because they couldn't find a fire at all. However, the walls in the kitchen and in the basement were all smoked afterwards. Count nine. When I was young, I figured out a trick to stop nightmares. Once I realized I was really scared, I'd stop and start screaming as loud as possible. This worked wonders. But one night, I was being chased by a humanoid monster. 
black robes with a white skeleton-esque face, I realized I was scared, stopped, started screaming, and felt myself wake up. But I almost immediately fell back asleep, and he was there staring at me and said, That won't work this time. Promptly shit myself and woke up. I don't use that technique anymore. Brains are assholes. Count ten. There's really only one thing I really have that I can't fully explain, other than sheer coincidence. Probably close to a decade ago, when I was 18, 19, or somewhere around there, I woke up in the middle of the night with this crazy pain in my side, near my hip. It stuck around for about 20, 25 minutes before finally going away. I managed to get back to sleep and all was well. I found out a couple days afterwards that my grandmother had recently fell and broke her hip on that same night, not long before the time I woke up with my pain. That was definitely a, huh, that's weird moment. Edit. Actually, I do have another one. One time in high school, in the middle of class, a picture frame fell off the table in the back of the room. Nobody near the table, no breeze or AC that could have done it and the frame was stationed in the middle of the table, and there's no way it could have fallen off unless it was also pushed forward. After that happened, the teacher proceeded to tell everyone about the ghost she swore followed her around. Account 11. I can't believe I actually have a story for this. When I was a younger kid, I had a really hard time getting to sleep, and I normally got to bed really late at night. My mom has always been that way, too. So, my mom mentioned that she heard something at night and wanted me to stay up a little longer to hear it. I did. It was summer anyway. Fast forward to that night. It's about one in the morning. My mom said it usually happens during her nighttime routine, so she told me to sit in the living room and listen while she went to brush her teeth. That's when I heard it. There were footsteps upstairs. You could hear the footsteps start at the window in my parents' room, then walk away towards the other bedroom, baby sister. It sounded muffled until the footsteps arrived to the landing of the stairs. Then it got louder because the landing was hardwood floor. After a few steps, then you would hear the footsteps on the carpet again when they arrived at my sister's room. But this time, they didn't go all the way to the window. They went to my sister's crib and paused for a moment before continuing back to the window in my parents' room. I listened to this for about five to 10 minutes with the footsteps taking about a minute to go from the window to the crib and back. My mom then came out of the bathroom and said, I gold you, I heard something. Well, we then opened the door and it stopped completely for the night, as far as we know at least. The next night I do the same thing and hear it again. So I open up the door as send our dogs up, a German shepherd and a border collie, who get to the top of the stairs and immediately turn around and bolt down the stairs. My stepdad was there that night and quickly ran upstairs after the dogs came down and looked everywhere. There was not a single place he didn't look. There was nothing to be found and the windows were still locked. Couldn't explain it for years. And the neighbors that moved in after us apparently heard the same footsteps. Account 12. I used to put in drop ceilings about four years back and I was working at NC school for the deaf. Me and my buddy Kenny went in one Saturday morning to finish a few of the smaller rooms. I took the rooms on one end of the hallway, and he took the ones on the other. It was a pretty long hallway with medium-sized rooms, so we knew we wouldn't get it all done that day, but more than usual since no one else was working on Saturday. I'm cutting tile in my first room, and I can hear Kenny walking back and forth by the room I'm in. After I finish cutting in the border tiles for the first room, I walk down to the other end of the hall to see how things were coming along, and he proceeded to ask me if I was ever going to get to work, that I had just been making noise or grunting in the room next to him. Now keep in mind that this place was very empty, as in we had the keys and had to unlock it to get in. It all kind of happened really quick, but we both heard something run past the open door and I swear I caught a glimpse of something. I have no idea what it was, but every hair on my body stood up and Kenny said, leave your stuff and let's get the fuck out of here. It's kind of a locally known thing that that school is haunted, but man, I still get goosebumps thinking about that day. Account 13. Real late to the party, but whatever, I'll type it anyway. This happened years ago when I was around 17. 
One night I was up late watching TV and fell asleep on the couch. I woke up at around 4.30 a.m. and went to bed. Everything seemed normal. The next morning, my mom asked where I had gone the night before. I was real confused. The night before, she and my dad had been woken up by the sound of the front door of the house closing. They went downstairs at 2 a.m. and looked outside. My car was not in the driveway. They figured that I'd gone to give a drunk friend a ride home or something, so they weren't worried about it. My dad sat on the couch, the same one I had fallen asleep and woken up on, and ate a midnight snack, watched some TV, and went back to bed around 2.30 a.m. We figured out that I had fallen asleep sometime between 12.30 a.m. and 1.30 a.m., because that's when the TV show I remember watching as I drifted off was on. The soles of my feet were extremely dirty, as though I'd been walking around outside with no shoes on. So, I disappeared, with my car, for a few hours that night. I have absolutely no memory of what happened, and if Mom hadn't said anything that morning, I wouldn't have even known it happened. Account 14. A couple weeks ago, I was driving between Roswell, NM, and Albuquerque. NM about an hour out of Roswell at like 2 a.m. I remember thinking, I'm so tired if something doesn't wake my ass up, I'm pulling over and sleeping in my car until morning. Next thing I know, everything is green. This giant green fireball just shoots right over my car, showering sparks everywhere. I panic and almost swerve off the road, but I saw it hit the ground about a mile away. So I think, holy fuck, a meteorite. That was huge, too. How did I not notice it behind me? The next day, after I was rested, I was thinking about it and remembering how green it was. Account 1. It happened around a year ago when I was visiting my grandparents. I was sleeping when I suddenly woke up. I wasn't wearing my glasses, but I was 100% sure someone stood in front of me. I immediately said hi like it was normal. I thought it was my grandma, even though that would be weird too. Then I realized it was in the middle of the night and no one was in my room. Really weird. I never told anyone about it. I'm familiar with sleep paralysis, but I could move. I stood up, put on some light, grabbed my glasses, no one was there. Edit. Also, another story from when I was younger, like seven, I think. I was randomly playing on my own in my room with Legos or something. Then, a weird orange-shaped thing sort of floated from my sister's room and went upstairs towards the attic. I, being a scared seven-year-old, ran downstairs. My mom believed me because she didn't think a seven-year-old could make up such a story. I went to school, told the story to some friends. Sometime later, I was playing in my room with a friend from school. Again, an orange-shaped thing floated from my sister's room to the attic. This time, I wasn't the only one who saw it. My friend did, too. We were both scared and once again ran downstairs. I never saw it again in the few years we lived in that house after the orange thing. My friend went to a different school. When I saw him a few years later, one of the first things he mentioned was, Do you still remember when we saw that orange thing in your house? Account 2. One summer when I was in university, I worked at the church office as the receptionist. On Fridays, I was often alone in the building and just answered the phone. One Friday, the music pastor was down in the sanctuary setting up for Sunday, and I was upstairs in the office. After about an hour of not seeing one another, I heard him screaming my name as if in distress. I ran downstairs, expecting that he was seriously injured, but nobody was there. I searched all over the building and then the parking lot. His car was gone. I called him on his cell and he told me he had left about half an hour before I heard him screaming. It was pretty frightening. Make of those what you will. Account 3. A few years ago, I was going for a bike ride down by the beach. They had just made new trails that went pretty deep into the woods and connected to the next town over. So one day, I made my way down to the trails and started my bike ride. After a few minutes, I stopped to take a drink of water and noticed that the mosquitoes were out of control. I thought about turning around but decided since they didn't bother me while I was riding my bike, I'd be fine. I rode for another 30-ish minutes and came up to a sand pit where the path was supposed to be. It was by the beach, so lots of the paths had long stretches of sand that made it almost impossible to ride your bike through. But luckily... The sides of the path were matted down so I could ride my bike through on the side of the path. I started riding on the side and rounded the corner when I saw a woman further ahead of me pushing a stroller. I thought it was weird because we were so far out, and I almost never saw anyone, let alone a lady pushing a stroller. Plus, 
She wasn't even on the side of the path. She was trying to push the stroller right down the middle of the path in the sand. Pushing a stroller in the sand is hard as hell, and I could see her fighting with it to keep it going. So I thought it was weird, but stayed on the side of the path and started getting closer to her, ready to pass. When I got probably like 100 feet away, she stopped and took one hand off the stroller and stretched it out to the side I was trying to pass on. I thought she was just making sure I didn't clip her or the stroller as I passed by. So I squeezed by her outstretched hand and kept going. I rode for a while more until I came to another sand pit. This one was way longer, and you couldn't ride on the sides, so I decided I would just turn back. Account 4. When I was about 5'6", we were living in a rented house that seemed normal enough, but strange things started to happen shortly after we moved in. My older brother liked doing these huge 500-piece puzzles, and he would put them together on the floor of our bedroom. They started getting messed up during the night. Everyone naturally assumed it was me, but it wasn't. Not long after that began, I started to have really bad nightmares about a woman in her early 20s. She was in a white cotton nightgown with violet flowers on it, had long, wavy, tangled black hair, and was swaying from the ceiling light. She would stare at me with a look of pure hatred. It got so bad that my parents took me to a therapist who said I was having night terrors. About a month after the night terrors started, we suddenly moved to another house. My parents claimed it was because they found a house closer to my dad's work. And just like that, the night terrors stopped and my brother's puzzles were left intact. It wasn't until 15 years later visiting the family that I found out the truth. My mother was talking to one of our neighbors about my night terrors, and she said that another family with a little girl rented the place a few years before us, and she had the exact same nightmares, right down to the nightgown with the pretty purple flowers. The neighbor also mentioned that no one seemed to stay in that house for more than a year. My mom thought that was too much of a coincidence. So she started asking around and found out from an older couple in the neighborhood that a young woman had killed herself in the house in the early 60s. My experience took place in the mid-80s. My mother went to the library and looked through the microfiche and found the news articles. It turns out that the girl in her early 20s had mental health issues and was being cared for by her parents. She had gone into that room in the middle of the night and hung herself from the ceiling light. I never got to see the picture they had of the girl in the paper, but my mom said she had long, wavy black hair. I'll never forget her eyes burning through me and her face distorted in silent rage. Account 5. I had just moved back to my hometown after attending an art school for two years. The only apartment I could find was a really run-down loft over a warehouse for $50 a month. This was in 1971, way before these kinds of apartments were cool. It was cheap even back then, and though I wondered a bit about that, it wasn't totally out of the norm. It did have tall windows and skylights, so it worked great for a studio. Since it was a loft, it was a big, wide-open space with the bathroom being the only room. There were two other doors, one to the stairs down to the street and the fire escape door that had one of those fire alarms on it if you go out of it. The bathroom was like a box char cubicle with a shower, sink, and toilet. I had been living there about a month when one night I woke up and went to use the bathroom. The door had a small slide lock on it, and I always locked it out of habit. Just as I was about to leave, I heard heavy footsteps walk up to the bathroom door, and I watched in horror as the doorknob turned and rattled, shaking the whole door. It was the first time in my life where I was so scared that I actually felt my body go completely numb. I thought for sure that someone had gotten in, and now I was going to be raped and killed. The lock was a little wimpy thing a granny could have broken. The doorknob rattled several more times. Then something hit the door really hard. Then I heard the footsteps walk away and go down the steps. I heard the door to the street open and close, then silence. I think it took me nearly 30 minutes to get the courage to leave that little bathroom. When I finally did, I turned on every light in the place and went to inspect the door to the street. There were three locks on that door. Two of them could only be locked from the inside, and those were locked. Nothing could have come in or gone out that way. I even checked the fire escape, but it was locked in a similar way. I couldn't sleep the rest of that night. As it turned out, that was the scariest thing to happen in that loft. After that, I would hear footsteps and doors open and close all the time and a few other not-so-scary things. That place convinced me and quite a few others that these things were real. I ended up living there for three years and would have stayed longer, but the place got sold, and the new owners wanted to move into the loft themselves. 
They only lived there two months before moving out the cowards. Count six. I dreamed that a candle or something tipped over and lit me on fire. The fire began to cover my arm and back, so I rolled and eventually woke up really freaked out. I woke my wife up and told her about it, then went back to sleep. The next morning I got a phone call telling me that my father was in the hospital after his shirt caught fire and burned his arm and back quite badly. He was in a different time zone, so he was awake cooking when it happened, which was around the same time I dreamed of catching fire. Not so scary, but those are some long odds that my father would catch fire and I would dream about it at the same time. Account 7. I was about 12 years old and staying at my grandparents' house after my aunt's wedding. The house itself wasn't very big and was the same house that my mother and her brother's sisters lived in growing up. After the wedding reception was over, my mom wanted to take me back to my grandparents for the night so all of the adults could go out and get a couple more drinks. When we arrived at the house, my mother and I both could very faintly hear a baby crying with a woman trying to comfort the baby. Now, the house isn't very big, so you could hear pretty much any noise from any point in the house. Our initial thought was that someone forgot to turn off one of the TVs in the house, so we both walked around the house trying to find the TV that was left on. To our surprise, not a single TV or radio was left on, but the volume of the woman and the baby remained constant. It didn't matter which room we were in, whether we were in the basement or on the landing, the volume of the lady and the baby was always the same. This, of course, scared the heck out of me as I never believed in ghosts before this happened, but there was no other explanation for it. Now, my mother was a little freaked out as well, but she had a bar to get to. She then just told me that it was nothing and got in her car and left me alone in the ghost house. I immediately turned the TV on with the volume set as high as possible without busting my eardrums. I was exhausted but drank pop to stay awake and not give this thing an opportunity to attack me. My parents showed up a couple of hours later to find a kid all wired on sugar just staring at the TV screen. I later told my aunt, who grew up in that house, the story, and she was ecstatic. She has always claimed that she heard a woman and a baby in that house growing up, but nobody believed her. Ever since that day, I believe that something like ghosts exists to some degree. It doesn't matter how much evidence or data people show me claiming ghosts don't exist, I know what I heard, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. At least mine was pretty nice and didn't break glass and other stuff like some of these stories. Account 8. I'm probably too late for this thread, but this just happened to me a couple of days ago, so here goes. My wife and I were backcountry camping in Redwoods National Park in California, and as we went to sleep in our tent, a heavy fog rolled in. I was sleeping soundly, but around 3 a.m., I woke suddenly with a sense that something was outside our tent. I heard the sound of light, muffled footsteps, and a quiet hissing or whispering sound, almost like something was muttering to itself. Assuming it was a bear or raccoon, I gently unzipped the rain fly of my tent and looked out. As soon as I opened the tent, the muttering sound ceased. The fog was so thick I could barely see more than 15 feet away. The moon and the night sky weren't visible at all. I turned on my headlamp to get a better look, and in the distance, I saw a faint light turn on as well. At first, I thought it might be another hiker, although we were about 15 miles out into the backcountry. But it was a yellowish-orange flickering light only a couple of feet off the ground. I saw a silhouette of a humanoid shape that almost looked like it was beckoning to me. I grabbed my knife, got out of my sleeping bag, and walked into the night. As I approached the light, I could see the humanoid shape more and more clearly, but I started to get really unnerved. It didn't move. It didn't make any noise. Who or what would be out here at 3 a.m., 15 miles into the woods? I turned once to look back at my tent, and when I turned back, the light was gone. The next morning, we searched the area where I saw the light but didn't find any tracks. The thing that scared me the most is that right near where the light was, there was a 50-foot cliff leading into a stream below. TLDR, I was camping in the backcountry, saw a light floating in the woods at night. Turned out the light was right above a 50-foot ravine. Count 9. There are two stories I have that still give me shivers, both of which came from my grandma's house. I went to my grandma's place to help her move after the loss of my grandfather. Things were a little emotional. Either way, there was one night where I woke up with a pain in my chest. I woke up and waited for it to go away. It took like 30 minutes, but it did. Then I realized I really had to take a piss. Like, really bad. I went and took my piss with no problem. Here's where the scary part hits. 
My grandma has a long hallway. Like, if I had to guess, I would probably say it was about 40, 50 yards of hallway. It always just made me feel uneasy. Well, this time when I walked down it, the hair on the back of my neck was standing up, and I felt like I was being watched. I turned the light on and felt a little better. I walked out of the bathroom after taking literally the most relieving piss of my life and walked back to the end of the hallway. I turned the light back off and at the other end of the hallway I saw a dark figure just standing there. It felt like it was just staring at me. I turned the light back on and there was nothing there. I turned it back off and there it was again. I peed a little. I slept in my car the rest of the night. Time number two was recently. We didn't immediately sell the house after my grandma moved. We remodeled it to make it more modern. So I went by to check on the house and ended up staying the night. I went to go to sleep and did all the normal stuff. Turned the lights off, closed the door, etc. I started to hear tapping coming from the corner of the room. I turned the light back on and the tapping stopped. I repeated this process for like 20 minutes until I just got over it and ignored the tapping. Then I heard footsteps in the hallway and the sound of something dragging along the ground. Then about five minutes later, I heard drums. I noped the fuck out of there and boarded the nope train to fuck that Urton and haven't gone back. I want to say we sold the house recently. Account 10. During my second year in college, I was home one weekend visiting with the family and such. Well, I went out with a friend from high school Saturday night. We went to a few fraternity parties, hit a few bars, you know, college town stuff. I got back home early in the morning, 3 a.m., maybe. And after coming inside, setting my keys and wallet on the table and locking the door back, I was walking through the living room to the stairs to go to bed when I heard my mom say my name behind me. Thinking it was my mom, I replied, yes, ma'am, and turned around to see just a dark, empty living room. It sounded so much like my mom that I actually replied to it. I told her about it the next morning and she looked genuinely freaked out. I just told her I was hearing things because I had a long night out, but I know what I heard. Account 11. I'm a naturally skeptical person, but I cannot rationally explain what both I and my friend witnessed. To this day, it bothers me that I'm not able to explain what we saw. The year was 2009. My best friend and I lived in a relatively small town. Not yet being 21, we didn't have a lot of things we could do to occupy our nights, so we settled on walking around the cemetery at midnight. It is important to note that neither of us had taken any drugs, medications, or alcohol prior to this encounter. My mom was very into ghost hunters at the time, so we decide to basically conduct an experiment. We start saying things like, if there is anyone here that would like to make contact with us, you can show yourself while walking through the place slowly. Once we started saying those things, the entire mood of the cemetery seemed to change somehow. The atmosphere became ominous and oppressive. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye on our right side, I start seeing what looks like someone dressed in white, running between tombstones, following us. We decide to check it out and wander off the paved path. We're standing off the beaten path about halfway into the cemetery, and I again repeat, is there someone or something here that wants to make contact with us and wait for an answer? I really, really wish I hadn't said that. Both of us begin to hear footsteps crunching on the frozen grass in the darkness. The sound was coming towards us. Most people would nope out by now, but I decided I was getting to the bottom of this. The sounds got closer, and then it stepped into the light where we could see it. It was the disembodied figure of a person, the outline of which was somehow perfectly visible by moonlight and appeared to be darker than the night around it. We were able to make out the features of this thing, but it was also partially transparent. It shimmered as it moved, and it moved steadily towards us. By the time it got ten feet away, we began to hear whispering, like a long, drawn-out breath angrily being forced out of a person that is intent on doing you harm. We noped the fuck out of there and ran two miles back to the car. I still cannot rationally explain what I saw, but I know what I saw was real. I still remain skeptical, but I now refuse to go into a cemetery after dark. There are things there that don't like being woken up. Account 12. I had a terrible nightmare one night, two creatures pulling me down and taking me somewhere terrible. I woke up suddenly and realized I was screaming and probably woke the neighbors. Immediately, my boyfriend called me. I picked up and he started explaining a horrible nightmare he just had. Also, he just called to see if I'm well, since his dream felt very real. It was the same one I had, except he was watching me being pulled away by these two creatures. 
He lived at the other side of the town, so there was no way he could have heard me or anything. I have no idea how it is possible to dream the same things at the same time. Account 13. So my gran died a few years back. She had been really ill for a while and passed away in hospital with my dad, two aunts, uncle, her four kids, and my cousin around her bed. When the hospital staff were taking her away, my dad made sure all of my gran's personal effects were accounted for so that nothing was lost or left behind when they had to leave. He took off her rings, her necklace, and her wristwatch and gave them to one of my aunts. She put everything in her purse, but for whatever reason, she kept the wristwatch in her hand and just held it. Later, she realized that the watch had stopped working around the time of my grand's passing, give or take five minutes, which I guess gave the watch more meaning, even if it was just a coincidence. A few days passed, and my aunt never put the watch down. We were all waiting in my grand's house for her to be brought back from the morgue. She was lifted up the stairs in her coffin while we were all waiting in the living room and was placed in her bedroom, right next to her bed. We all got our turn to go in and see her and pay our respects, etc. After I had come out, I saw my aunt sitting in the corner of the living room by herself. All of a sudden, the expression on her face changed from sad to shocked, but then she looked sort of comforted. She was looking at the wristwatch again, and it had started ticking. The hands had moved 20 minutes, the exact amount of time my gran had been in the house. This still gives me goosebumps to think back on. Account 14. Not really scary per se, but kind of spooky and unexplained. When I was in high school, I went to a friend's Halloween-themed birthday party since her birthday is in mid-October. At the time, she lived in a house in a very large, well-known housing development, one of the various incarnations of Levittown. The upstairs setup of this particular house meant that the stairs went up to the second floor and the bathroom was right in front of you, and to the immediate left and right were two fairly decent-sized bedrooms. The staircase descended into the living room. I was standing at the top of the stairs getting ready to go downstairs, and she was in her room with another friend to my right. There were about five people standing around the bottom of the staircase chatting and several more people in the living room. To my left was an unused bedroom that had some moving boxes and other junk in it because my friend and her dad had just moved in a few weeks prior to the party. As I went to go down the stairs, this transparent glowing shape, about the size of a pet cat or small dog, came floating from the bedroom to my left. It floated down the stairs rather quickly and floated into the center of the living room and vanished. The entire house went silent. You could hear a pin drop. About 15 people saw this thing, including myself and every single person standing at the bottom of the stairs and most of the people in the living room. I stared at the people below me and after a few moments asked, Did you guys see that? Everyone was wide-eyed and nodded yes. It was super weird. After doing a little reading on some theories surrounding ghosts and spirits, I tend to think that it was a ghost, not a spirit, as it seemed to be more of a residual image of some kind. My thought is that it was visible due to the increased energy in the house all the party guests. Who knows, really? That's the best explanation I could come up with. Account 15. My ex lived in an apartment that she was told was haunted. It was small, above a shop, on the Esplanade in Hervey Bay, Queensland. We didn't believe it was haunted, but weird things kept happening. On more than one occasion, I would be woken up in the middle of the night for no reason, and the front door would always be open. Every single time, there was something that looked like the shadow of a child standing upright in the doorway. I thought it was just me seeing this. But when I told my ex and her roommate about it, they went white. They'd been seeing things, too but not a shadow child. They saw a shadow man and sometimes a shadow cat. As we talked, we could feel the atmosphere of the apartment pressing in on us. We could feel something in the room with us. I thought it was a bunch of horse shit. I don't believe in ghosts or whatever, but the more we talked, the more scared we got. So my ex's roommate called up one of her spiritual friends who does cleansings regularly. He came into the apartment and instantly broke into a sweat. He told us something bad was going to happen now that we were aware of it. We did a cleansing and casting out ritual, and right at the very end, my ex's roommate's CD player switched on and played Bon Jovi's Bad Medicine at full volume. The CD player wasn't plugged in, and it didn't have any batteries in it. The only way we could get it to turn off was to take it across the road to the beach and dump it in the ocean.
Count one. When I was a little girl, my grandma frequently would take me to antique shops with her. Usually, we just looked and learned about the items. But one of the times, she bought me a pair of twin dolls that I fell in love with. One was a boy and one was a girl. They were extremely old and their skin was made of what the shopkeeper called the first plastic ever made. I'm not sure of the accuracy of that statement, but anyway, I loved them and played with them daily, always taking care to be gentle so they would stay in decent condition. One evening I was playing with them and my mom called me down to dinner. I tucked the little boy doll underneath my covers to put him to bed, kissed him, and ran downstairs. I loved him especially because I never had a boy doll before. After dinner, I went back upstairs to play in my room. Forgetting that he was tucked under my covers, I took a running leap and belly flopped on my bed. Underneath the covers came a loud, long, mechanical sounding voice that yelped painfully, Mama! I pulled the covers back to find my boy doll and I was perplexed because I had never known him to have a voice box. I squeezed him again several times in varying degrees to get him to say it again, and nothing happened. I calmly asked my mom if she could get his voice box to work and explained what happened. She and my dad both tried and nothing worked. He stayed quiet. As an adult, I haven't been able to get him to work again. I posted this picture on an antique subreddit under a different account, asking if it would have a voice box, and was told that they were too old to have that feature. I've always wondered about this. Also, the doll's skin has deteriorated now, leaving them mostly armless. On a side note that is probably unrelated, when I was 16, my best friend and I played with a Ouija board at her house. I had long forgotten about my doll and the sound it made, and had only told my parents on the day it happened. We made contact with a young spirit who said he was eight years old. When we asked him how he died, he said he drowned. Suddenly, he moved the planchette to goodbye. We asked him why he was leaving, and he spelled out Rusty. Rusty was the name of my best friend's dog who had just been led inside by her mom. We told him that it was okay, Rusty was nice, and that he could stay. We asked him a few more questions, and he answered them, but then Rusty walked into the room. The planchette started moving quickly to M, then A, back and forth, spelling Mama, 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 Mama. It wouldn't stop until we lifted our fingers away. Account 2. Before my brother was born, we moved in with my gran into her house my mother's childhood home, as she had three spare rooms and we were about to outgrow our current house. A good few years on from that, my brother and sister, who were about five and eight respectively, were both asleep in the room they shared, and I went in and opened their window as it had been a really hot day, and being in the UK, we don't have air con. A good few hours later, I came back into the room as I figured it might have gotten cooler and I didn't want my bro and sis being too cold. I gently woke up my sister asking if she wanted me to shut the window, and that's when the bedroom light flickered on. I didn't think much of it, shut the window and the light flickered on again. That's when I thought it was a bit odd as I've seen lights flicker off and on while switched on, but never on when a light was switched off. The next day I mentioned this to my mother and her face just went chalk white. Her brother, my uncle, died in that room of an asthma attack and she desperately tried to save his life that night unfortunately to no avail, but the night of the flickering light was the same day as the anniversary of his death. It never freaked me out, but I found it quite comforting thinking he's in a way watching over us. Account 3. Years ago, I lived in an older house downtown with a roommate. We both played guitar and had a nice setup in the basement. On the wall was an old mirror that was affixed to the wall. It was there when we moved in. One day I came home and noted my roommate wasn't there when he was supposed to be. I went to the basement and started playing guitar. Something caught the corner of my eye in the mirror. I turned to look and saw what I can only explain as a cloud rising. I looked to the other side of the room and saw no explanation for this at all. It scared me so much that I immediately put the guitar down, went upstairs and left the house. I went to the local cafe to chill till my roommate came home. Strangely, I found him there. He looked pale and stressed. He started telling me about the cloudy ghost he saw in the basement mirror about two hours earlier. I just about shat my pants. Account 4. I'm late, unfortunately, but maybe this will be seen by some... The summer after my freshman year in college, I got a missions internship that involved me, F, 19 at the time living in a church with one other person, M, 25 at the time while working in an underserved community in Kentucky. I had my own sleeping space in the nursery. 
It was the smallest private room on the main floor adjacent to the sanctuary. From the first night I was there, I was really on edge when I was alone in this room. I assumed I was being silly and was just nervous about being in an unfamiliar place PNW native, never been anywhere near the south before, but I couldn't sleep at night. I lit candles and listened to music to try to soothe the anxiety, but I slept maybe four hours a night the first week. The second week, I wore headphones to try to fall asleep, and I had the worst dream I have ever had in my life. I was in a dark room, under a spotlight, and I was sitting in a chair facing my boyfriend. We were having a conversation about something random, and I looked away for a split second. When I turned back to him, his demeanor was entirely different. He was sitting in his chair, very slump-like, relaxed, chin tilted down and looking up at me through the top of his eyes, grinning. He looked seriously evil, and I remember being paralyzed with fear, the most afraid of anything I have ever been. I was sure in that moment that he was going to hurt me, torture me almost. And then I thought, this is a dream, you're not real. This is a dream, you can't hurt me. And then he turned into sand and fell in a pile on the chair and floor, and I immediately woke up crying. The next day, I told my co-worker about this dream, thinking he might say something reassuring like, dreams are so weird that's creepy. Instead, he got super spiritual on me and said, I know this sounds strange, but I really feel like you should pay attention to that. I was annoyed at him but I decided not to sleep in the nursery anymore and camped out in the massive sanctuary. I never had another nightmare while I was there. However, this boyfriend of mine became extremely psychologically abusive within months of me returning home, and I ended up with a restraining order a year later. I don't consider myself to be a very spiritual person anymore, but part of me wonders whether that dream was a sign from somewhere or my subconscious picking up something I didn't yet know about him or just a strange coincidence. Account 5. This will probably get buried, but I'll still share it. One night when I was home for school, I was chilling in my little brother's room around 2 a.m. I was pretty baked, but still clear-headed, and I decided to go downstairs to the kitchen to get something to eat. I put my clothes on, opened the door, and turned right to head down the stairs. I looked down the hallway toward the staircase and saw this picture looking right back at me. I know for a fact that there was nothing in that spot that I could have mistaken for a dark figure with bright eyes. So I paused, stared for a second, and considered how much I wanted that snack. In the end, I simply said, nope, sheepishly to myself, and went back in the room and shut the door till morning. I've never seen anything like it since then, but it still kind of freaks me out when I think about it. Account 6 I was on my way to the choir performance I had in a town on the other side of the country. I had to catch the sound check session because if you're not there, you don't perform later. Rules of the choir. I'm running a bit late, so I'm driving just a bit over the speed limit, 130 km h here, about 80 Mapis seats, but the road is almost completely empty, so I figured it's okay, even though it was raining quite heavily. When I was merging onto the highway, I overtook a car that kind of stuck out from the rest. It was a dark green rover with a Bosnian license plate, very rare in my country, and a little sticker in the back that looked like a logo of a flight club or school. It was a very specific combination. I'm driving on the right lane when a dark green rover passes me. It caught my attention because I was driving pretty fast, and I wanted to see who was in such a hurry to overtake me as I was overtaking every other driver I encountered on my way so far. Okay, so the guy just caught up and passed me. I don't know why, but I remembered the last three numbers of his plate, and I still do. Won't share. A couple of kilometers down the road, I see a pair of lights approaching in my rear mirror, so I move to the right again. When it passes, it was the same car, same plates, same sticker, same brand and color. And then this happened two more times. The last time was a bit freaky. I saw someone beginning to pass me, and I thought, Hello, Rover! And there he was. Two of the times it happened on a stretch that had no stops or exits, so I don't know how this happened and I never once overtook him, except at the beginning. But here comes the good part. I'm driving back from the concert. It's pretty late and the rain is pouring like hell, so visibility is bad. I was slowly driving home and the same car passed me twice. I tried to snap a picture I was expecting the second time, but the first time freaked me the fuck out. But the rain and a shitty phone didn't add up well. Account 7. A couple of years back, a friend and I were driving home from work. 
late at night, and saw the whole weird lights in the sky thing. They did the whole impossible flight path and pattern. We didn't say anything to each other for five minutes after until he spoke and said, Did, uh, you see anything weird back at the last highway exit? Since then, we've always kind of kept it to ourselves because it sounds dumb as hell. Anytime I drive near that exit, I always think about it. Account 8. No one believes that I didn't somehow mistakenly do this myself. You know the pictures that are on your computer when you get it to use as wallpaper or screensavers? When I got my computer, it was set up to do a slideshow of these pictures. I glanced at my screen and there was a picture of me at the circus sitting with a group of clowns. Now that picture does exist. It was taken at the Shrine Circus about five years before that. I do not know where the hard copy is. I never gave a copy to anyone. I never scanned it into my computer. I didn't know how to do that when it was taken. No one sent or was sent that picture over the internet. No one with access to my computer knows how to scan a pic into a file. It freaked me out, so I deleted it from the file. Two days later, it was back. I deleted it again and it was gone, but left a close-up of one of the clowns, the one that was sitting to the left of me. I've since gotten Windows 10 and I haven't seen the picture, but I can't find anything on Windows 10, so I'm still uneasy. Account 9. I was a cop for a few years in the Miami metro area in my early 20s. About a month after completing my field training program, I got dispatched to an industrial silent alarm call in a pretty rough neighborhood. Alarm calls were pretty routine, but always kept us on our toes, as the suspect could range from faulty wiring to a 6'5 naked dude on PCP trying to pry some copper. I'm on the scene within a couple of minutes of getting the call. Lo and behold, my old field training officer, a sergeant, and her new trainee pull up. By this time, the alarm company had notified the owner, who provided dispatch with a code to enter a side door with an electric keypad. My sergeant had the rookie watch the front of the warehouse while me and her made entry through that side door. We have our guns and lights out and start sweeping up and down the aisles, which were about 25 feet high and filled with old electronics and furniture mostly. We can't find any light switches, so we continue sweeping with our lights. Just as we had almost finished clearing the warehouse, we heard very fast footsteps from the opposite side. We start jogging our way there, yelling out, Police, come out! And the like. We come to where we thought we heard the footsteps when my sergeant suddenly spun around. She later said she saw a flash in her peripheral vision and ducked around to the other side of the warehouse shelf. No one's there. We start creeping back out towards where we came from to wait for K-9 when we hear a fucking high-pitched giggle from right behind us. Like imagine the most stereotypical little girl in a horror movie giggle. We spin around and both light up a four-foot little girl with black hair down to her butt sprinting down the aisle the opposite way. She had to have appeared out of thin air because we were both scared as shit by this point and our senses were at 110% and we completely missed her. We naturally holstered our guns and gave chase. Here's the thing. Neither of us could catch her. My sergeant wasn't particularly fast, and I wasn't a track star, but both of us were surely capable of catching a small child. Nope. Turn a corner, she'd be ten feet further up the aisle than where she was before she turned the corner. Within twenty seconds, we lose her completely. At that point, we both went outside and waited for more units to come. The property owner gets there along with about five other units and a canine, and we re-enter. The owner turns on the lights and we search the entire place, top to bottom. Nothing is stolen, and the girl cannot be found anywhere. Again, impossible. As all the entries were both locked from the inside and padlocked on the outside, and we had officers covering the entire exterior, there's just no possible way that a child could have been in there without us finding her. My sergeant was extremely Catholic and swears up and down that it was either a demon or a lost spirit. I think I might have to agree. Account 10. My mom passed away 20 months ago now. About four months after she died, my son, who was just learning to talk, would keep babbling away into the phone in his funny toddler twin language. When I asked him who he was talking to, he replied, Nanny. I nearly fell over the first time it happened, but didn't say anything or make a big deal. He continually did this almost daily for months. My husband and I also observed him walking past some stereo speakers in our lounge, and he stops and puts his ear to the speaker for like 30 seconds. I said, what are you listening to? 
Nanny, he replied and walked off with a happy smile. This all stopped a while ago now, though, and no more mentions of Nanny at all. Weird. But actually comforting. It's funny because my husband was always joking and saying to Mum, you better send me a sign from the other side when you're gone so we know you're okay. She had had a long-term illness. Account 11. I was driving home from dropping my girlfriend off at work last April. It was 5 a.m. and storming. Down the road, I saw this brilliant blue light. I got up to the source of it, and it's just this big ball of electricity floating in the middle of the intersection with tendrils of energy radiating into the air. It slowly floated up after a minute and sort of evaporated. Now, the rational explanation would be that I witnessed ball lightning, but it seemed almost intelligent somehow. Whatever it was doing, I got the impression that I interrupted it. Also, I don't recall seeing the traffic lights functioning at the time, but I might have just not been paying attention to them. Nobody ever believes me, but that's my story. Account 12. My mother and stepfather lived in a house in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and when my children and my nieces and nephews visited, they didn't like the area to the rear of the house. There was a bathroom and two bedrooms back there where guests stayed. Our dogs didn't like that area either. My mother jokingly bought a Ghostbusters sign and told the kids it had been ghostbusted, but the kids were dubious. A few years later, my mom and stepdad got into a big fight and he went to the guest area to sleep for a few days. One night, he felt something on the bed and thought it was my mother. It wasn't. It was a ghost, a woman in a nightgown. He said he didn't feel threatened. It was as if she was checking on someone or maybe checking on kids. He was British, an engineer, and very stiff upper lip and not prone to stories or hallucinations. So did the kids and the dogs pick up on a presence? It seems likely. Account 13. I was lying in bed on a Saturday morning. My bed is positioned so that if my bed is at the southwest corner of a rectangle, then the door to my bedroom is at the northeast corner. I lay in bed with my head facing the door. The door is at one end of the hallway. The other end of the hallway is the stairs leading down. Anyways, it's Saturday morning, I'm laying there half asleep. I hear my mom finish up chores, breakfast downstairs. She's getting ready to leave for work and yells up the stairs goodbye to me. My door is open, so I mumble something back. She exits through the front door and leaves. A few minutes later, I hear the front door open again. Oh, my mom must have forgot something. She does that a lot. I hear her walking throughout the house downstairs. When you live in a house your whole life, you start getting used to people walking around the house, where they're walking, and what they're sort of doing. Anyways, she's walking around and then starts walking upstairs. She's at one end of the hallway now, stopped. Then she starts walking towards my end of the hallway and stops. I call out, Mom? No answer. At this point, I'm thinking, oh, crap. Maybe it's a burglar who waited for my mom to leave. I'm dead. I call out again, Mom? No answer. At this point, I jolt up out of bed and run to my door. I look down the hallway. Nothing. I search the other rooms. Nothing. Account 14. I was playing with my phone around 2 a.m. when suddenly I heard a guy from outside my window saying, Hey boy, what are you doing? I was so scared and quickly hid under my blanket and just tried to sleep. During breakfast the next morning, I told my parents what happened. My mom said she went to get a glass of water in the kitchen around the same time I heard the voice. When she heard someone calling her using her nickname and asked how she's doing, she said she drank the water and quickly went back to bed. After listening to both me and my mom's stories, my dad went pale and said that he had a nightmare that very same night. In his nightmare, he saw a hooded man walking toward our house which was on fire and my sister was on the balcony screaming for help. The man turned around and smiled at my dad, saying that he's here to visit my mom, and I, my dad, woke up right after that. We ate breakfast in silence that morning. Account 15. No one will read this, but when my best friend's grandmother died, I spent the night at her house. The next morning we were at the kitchen table, about to eat breakfast and talking about her grandmother, when a mug on the table moved several inches straight and then stopped. We both looked at each other and confirmed that we saw what we did. I've always been super critical and skeptical, so I checked the table for watermarks from condensation, even strings and magnets. Nothing. Then my friend said, my grandma gave me that cup, also the watch I have. My grandpa gave it to me. It used to be my grandma's and they were cleaning out the house because grandma was moving into assisted living. 
It's a beautiful, delicate gold watch with a small diamond on the watch face. Two years ago, the watch stopped, and when I noticed, the first thing I thought was, something's wrong with Grandpa. He died two weeks later. I got the watch fixed when I was back in the States. A week and a half ago, it stopped again. I got a call this morning that my grandma had a stroke and likely won't live to the weekend. You can bet I'm hanging on to that watch. But if anyone can explain why this keeps happening, I'd love to hear it. Account 1. I live in a condominium and we own two apartments on the 7th and 8th floor. The only way to move between them is to step out of one apartment, take the elevator or the staircase, and enter the other one. One night, we ran out of ice cream upstairs and my mom told me to go get some from the downstairs freezer. So I took the keys to the 7th floor's apartment and since it was dinner time, no one was there. I walked into the pitch dark and realized that someone was sitting on the sofa. I flipped the switch to see my dad just sitting there. It was kind of weird, but I just went to get the ice cream and asked if he had a key to lock up. No answer. I shrugged and thought, well, if he came in and locked the door behind him, he must have one. Went back upstairs, and my dad was sitting there eating dinner. I freaked out and asked how the heck did he get up here so fast, and everyone told me that he's been here all this time. They told me it wasn't possible because I just saw him downstairs, but no one believed me. Now I never go down there alone. Account 2. I was home alone for a weekend a few years ago while I was still in high school. After school one day, I was driving home, and when I passed in front of my house, I thought I saw some old lady in white clothes in my sister's room looking through the window. I thought it was stupid, so I went into the room to check out what it actually was, but I couldn't find anything. I pretty much forgot about it until later that night I got a call from a very panicked and scared neighbor saying there was some old lady pacing back and forth in my sister's room. I still have no idea what it was, and I've never seen anything like it since. Account 3. I used to work doing maintenance at historic properties. There was a historic house museum I worked at when it wasn't open to the public. It was part of a whole landmark site, with a visitor's center and offices, and then the house was about half a mile up a dirt road in a wooded area. Sometimes I worked with a crew, but there were a lot of times I was there alone. One winter day, when it was really cloudy and dark, I was working alone to get ready to replace some electric work on the exterior of the house. I went inside and turned off the circuit to the whole property and I tested it. It was off. I locked the doors and went outside to work. After about an hour, I got down from my ladder and started walking around the house, and then one of the lights inside the house turned on. I started to freak out, but thought that maybe someone was playing a joke on me. I called the visitor's center on my walkie-talkie and confirmed that the only other person who was working that day was still there and hadn't left, and that all the keys to the house were present and accounted for. That's when I freaked out and ran the half mile up to the office. I made my co-worker come back with me to check out what was going on, but when we got to the house, the light was off again, but the bulb was still warm. All the doors were still locked and the circuit was still off. Still gives me shivers to this day. Account 4. In 2002, I lived in the East SF Bay area with my husband and two toddlers. I was grieving over the sudden death of my mother a month before. She'd had a major heart attack and died at 52 years of age. On an average day, I left my babies at home with my husband to run a quick errand by myself. I drove a block over through downtown Hayward to hit up the grocery store. I was on my way home and stopped at a red light waiting to make a left turn. The intersection had all blind corners, so it was difficult to see oncoming cars. My light turned green, I glanced both ways, waited the appropriate second, and stepped on the gas pedal. It would not move. I tried again, nothing. The car behind me honked. I looked down under my pedals quickly to see if something had possibly rolled under the pedal and found nothing. I looked up and suddenly a huge work truck loaded down with equipment ran his red light at what must have been 50 mapper. I was stunned. I gasped quickly pulled myself together, stepped on the gas pedal, and it worked with no hesitation. Suddenly, I smelled my mother's favorite perfume. Really amazing experience. Account 5. There was a small door that led to attic space in my bedroom when I was 11 to 13 years old, and it became a habit that I would shut the door as I walked into my bedroom a couple times a week. I didn't think anything of it, just assumed my mom didn't close it all the way when she left it. After a while, I made the mistake of joking with her when she made a comment about me not picking up after myself. I said something like, Every night I have to close the attic door behind you, 
How about you shut it all the way when you're done? As she then informed me that she hadn't been in the attic in months. I asked my brother, nope. Asked my father, nope. So then I started to pay really close attention to it. Making sure it was closed in the morning, checking it after school, checking it after dinner. Then head up to bed and open. After a couple of months of wondering, studying, and experimenting, I thought I'd see what happens if I just don't shut it. Opened the door before school and checked it after school, still open. Checked it after dinner, still open. Before bed, still open. Now I'm laying in bed, mind going crazy with the open door across the room. Decide to check it out so I roll over and focus on the black space into the attic to see a face staring back at me. Bolt downstairs, wake parents, get ridiculed by brother, switch bedrooms with brother, move into new house about six months later due to expanding household. New physics teacher and his wife bought our house. I could have forgotten all about that event and chalked it up to me having an overactive mind. But then my senior year, I discovered how awesome our physics teacher was. Became my favorite class and by far my favorite teacher. End of senior year, my friend and I took our VHS camcorder around town doing mostly silly things, but then took it to my old house to see what they've done with the place. We got a very fun tour. I got to tell stories about all the projects my dad did that were still part of the house. Then the wife leads us upstairs to show us the sewing room. I ask jokingly, Notice anything strange in this room? And her face goes blank. On camera, she asks what I mean, and I try to shrug it off, but end up saying something about the attic door. She confirmed that every time she comes up to sew, the attic door is open. She then tells us that the second day of being in the house, their dog, a German shepherd, had gone into the room, but would not go back downstairs. He started barking and could not be consoled, and then jumped through the window, landing on the tin roof over the porch and then running off. The dog did not come back until the next day and has not stepped foot into the hallway that leads upstairs since. I had the initial thought that I could show my parents and brother the story I had on film, but I decided to just let it be. Account 6. In 1975, I was flying an army helicopter during night training in blackout conditions near Fort Hood, Texas. I was at the controls with my co-pilot navigating. We were flying low, treetop to treetop, down a draw with a small seasonal creek. Suddenly, I had a compelling sense that we needed to make an emergency climb, which I did, almost vertically. As I pulled the aircraft up, with my nose pointed towards the stars through the chin bubble, I observed the leaves of a cottonwood tree being pressed aside against the plexiglass of my chin bubble. After a few seconds, and now a few hundred feet above the canopy, my co-pilot and I stared at each other with wide eyes, realizing we had barely avoided a collision. How did you see that tree? He asked me. I never did tell him that I didn't, because I have never known how to explain it. I went on to fly helicopters for 37 years, accident-free, and I still can't explain what happened that night. Account 7. This incident happened to my friend. He was visiting his relatives in a semi-rural town in India. During summers, people usually preferred to sleep on the roofs of their houses on cots. So that's what he did. Everything was normal. He spread his cot on the roof and fell asleep. Then, in the middle of the night, he woke up to see five women wearing white saris, a type of Indian clothing, with untied hair, dancing in circles on the neighboring house's rooftop. He was scared senseless, and spent the rest of the night awake under the sheets with his face hidden. P.S. A white sari is often associated with female ghosts in Indian urban legends. Account 8 when I was a kid, my brother and I would often babysit the neighbor's kid, Alex. Alex was really fond of my Lego set that I kept in the corner of my room, facing the window, and he would play for hours while my brother and I played video games in the living room. One night, while I fell asleep on the couch while babysitting, my brother woke me up and said, Alex is under your bed and shaking. I asked, what's wrong with him? My brother told me to follow him into the room and try to coax Alex out from under the bed. I went inside to find him on the verge of tears, trembling profusely under my bed. I asked Alex, what's wrong? Why are you under there? Alex whimpered, him, while looking at my sliding closet. As I walked towards the bed to help him out, he ran. He ran all the way back to his house and waited on his front steps until his parents got home. Later, my parents were out to dinner with his and he explained the whole story in detail to both sets of parents. His explanation sent shivers down my spine. When my brother and I left the house to meet up with his parents and find out what happened, 
My mom told me that Alex was playing with my Lego set when he heard a slight murmur from my closet, something that resembled a faint voice saying, Come here. He said that he looked behind him and noticed the closet had a slight opening with light peeking in from my lamp. He stared at the crack until he saw an eyelid open. Alex then hid under my bed after he gave out a slight yelp, which attracted my brother's attention. My family rushed back into my room and found my closet door ajar and a few things missing. My window had been left open when it was previously closed, and a few things knocked over that had not been touched previously. We still don't know what force we were reckoning with after that evening. Thank God nothing more severe happened. Account 9 I used to be a security guard on a campus that was a military fort since the Revolution. It had been updated throughout the years and was last used in Wabi Four with artillery, earth, concrete bunkers, and many brick-and-mortar buildings. When it became a college campus, the barracks, hospital, and officers' houses were converted to classrooms and dorms. There was one building on campus, a hotel where students learned bartending and hotel services that was infamous for being haunted. My shift was from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Starting at midnight, I would be alone on the campus. My job was to ensure everything was locked, lights were off, and to deter any intruders. But that hotel, it rarely had living guests. I would go through the building and turn off all the lights, only to turn around an hour later and see a light on again. Standing in the hotel lobby, after patrolling and confirming I was alone, I would hear things moving on the floor above me. Once I heard a chain dragging across the room above me, followed by a distant scream. On another night, I had another officer with me. As we were talking in the lobby, the temperature dropped and we heard a little girl giggling. In the basement, I would see shadows dart across the conference room. However, the biggest event that made me nope out was when I was in the lobby and looked up the staircase. I saw a woman's legs with black shoes walk from right to left on the floor above me and straight through a wall. Keep in mind, that's just the hotel. It used to be the officer's quarters. Stories say an officer died of the flu around Wabi Wad Tu. And before that, a man was executed during the revolution for being accused of being a spy. Like most hauntings, however, I do not know how much truth the stories hold. I didn't even talk about the voices I heard in the basement of the old hospital or the shadow people wandering the colonial graveyard in the middle of the campus. Footsteps following me in the darkness, faces staring at me from the bunker ruins, all of which I would check to ensure it wasn't just kids trying to hide from me. Ah, I miss that place. Count 10. This wasn't me, but I saw it happen, and it made me question my disbelief in the supernatural. Last time I was in New Orleans, I took a couple of friends to the Marie Laveau Voodoo Museum, which my friend Jessica was not too impressed by. Later that day, we were walking back to the Airbnb apartment we had rented and wandered past a house that had one of those historic location plaques on it. Turns out that house had been Marie Laveau's father's house. As we were all standing out front of this house, Jessica was complaining about how she thought the museum was disappointing, and her brand new Galaxy S5 went flying out of her hands and landed a good five feet away, totally destroyed. I was looking right at her when it happened. She didn't trip, she wasn't wildly throwing her arms around. There was no explanation for why her phone would have taken a leap like that. Also, it wasn't just a little scratched up like it had been dropped. It looked like it had exploded from within. Account 11. The late father of my best friend encountered what we assumed to be a Sasquatch. He was on a fly fishing trip somewhere in the Ozarks with some friends, staying in a remote cabin just near the river. He said they were hanging out one night throwing rocks at trees when they started hearing noises in the direction of their throwing. He said it just sounded like trees moving and sticks breaking, so he thought they might be disturbing a bear or possibly a big wolf. They headed back into the house to leave the animal alone. About an hour later, they are all woken up by a loud crash. They go outside to see a giant rock, about 400 pounds, that had been thrown at the front porch and did damage to the wood. They got their guns and circled the house to check for any danger when my friend's father sees lots of movement of trees and sound coming from just beyond the clearing. Still thinking it was a bear, I suppose, he yells real quick in that direction and is returned with what he described as a huge yodeling bear. They went to bed and left the next day. Account 12. Sharing my mom's two stories that always gave me the chills. One. 
When she was younger, her grandmother was staring out the window and the gates to the house were swinging back and forth. It was a hot summer day with no breeze. My mom asked her what she was looking at and she replied that it was angels moving the gate and that they had come for her. She, grandmother, died that night. Two, involves my grandfather, who died from a brain tumor before I was born. After he died, my grandmother would hear a loud knocking at the front door every night around the same time. But when she would get up to check, no one was there. She thought it might just be neighborhood kids and didn't think much of it, until one night around the same time she heard the knocking, and then every framed picture on her walls came crashing down at the same time. She went to see her priest the next day, and after some talking she realized her husband, who was blind as a bat, was buried without his glasses. Per the priest's suggestion, she went and buried the glasses next to his grave, and all the knocking stopped after that. Make of those what you will. Account 13. Me and a girl I was consistently hooking up with at the time had woken up in the morning and were watching TV or whatever. No one else was home, and we both heard a knocking come from the bathroom door. It was closed, that is attached to my room, and it startled us both. I pushed the door open, found nothing, and opened the attic and found nothing. Even walked outside to check if there were roofers working on the roof that I didn't know about and there was nothing. This was sometime last winter and I never figured it out. Account 14. I was reading the book Think and Grow Rich. In the book it says something along the lines of how you might notice something weird as you read it. Anyways, I decided to bring the book to read it at a coffee shop downtown. I was reading a paragraph about a parent with a deaf child. At that very moment, a child sat down near me. I didn't think much about it until his mother came over and started doing sign language with him. Account 15. I was in fourth grade and the teacher was giving us a spelling test. I was a good speller. And the words she was giving us weren't particularly hard, even though they were just random ones we hadn't studied for. I remember being sort of bored when suddenly I was startled to hear a man's voice very loud and clear inside my head. It said a single word and then it was gone. The word was believe. Right afterward, the teacher gave us the next word of the spelling test. It was believe. I've spent 30 plus years thinking about that. If you were to receive a paranormal communication and it could only be one word, could there be a better one? I'm not particularly religious, but whenever I question if there's more out there, I think about that one word and I guess I have to believe.